you know, even a funnel where I know they're they're using it. Mm -hmm. That's something I probably need to look at a little more. Well, I think again, Just buy more cameras and have them on both. <laughs> so Talk to him. Yeah. <laughs> Jeremy buys the cameras. And we're back. Is this number 40? Yes. Hey, there you go. I should have got that. <laughs> number 40. <sighs> well, uh, yeah, I'm just trying to get my mindset. This is a good one. I'm excited about this podcast for sure. Um, for one, I guess if people are listening to this one, we are into October at this point. It's not October when we're recording this, but it will be October. Yep. First week of October. We're we're in it. Seasons are open. Bucks are falling. Acorns are falling. Leaves are falling. Temperatures hopefully are falling. Do you know Don? A little bit. Yep. From before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How, how do you know? Uh, so we we would write for a lot of the same magazines. So anybody listening, today's podcast guest, if you can look at the title, is Don Higgins. Um, Don's been involved in a lot of stuff, but yeah. So Don Don's written for a long time. In fact, I mean, authored several books, but also a lot of magazine articles. And so that's how Don and I came across each other. Probably deer and deer hunting would be my guess, mm -hmm. is that he and I were writing at the same time for that magazine. Would you say most well known for real world? And he is, what, is he a founder of that company? <sighs> yeah. So one of the original founders, um, I, you know, not I don't, the show, not the reality show. Yeah. Uh, but MTV. it's the soybean blend. Mm -hmm. yeah. Soybeans. Yeah. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I think that a lot of people know Don from his writing, kind of he, he, kind of like a Bill Winky, and like both of those guys really were just good whitetail hunters, great strategy, writers. and were writers. Okay. And then I think that as things came about, like Bill obviously went Midwest Whitetail, Don went Real World, um, which I think he's still involved with. Uh, we can ask him, but I know he's got he's got a podcast, Chasing Giants, is his podcast, okay. um, and I mean. Really, that's probably what I would say Don is most well-known for. Dude's killed, I don't know, a bunch of two hundos. Uh, I did know that. I wasn't aware of the podcast. I'll have to check that mm -hmm. out. Yep, Chasing Giants is his podcast. Just on YouTube and Spotify mm -hmm. and stuff. Sweet. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, good podcast. He and I'm not sure who else hosted with him. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think he's killed four, five, two hundreds. Killed one last year. Really? For sure. Wow. Killed like a two... We'll get it from him. We will have to get his take on, and Strauss just informed Strauss Lama. Just let me know. we got a red moon coming up this weekend. I believe he is a moon guy. Okay. I think. I tell you what, dude. Most 200-inch killers that I know are moon guys. Yeah. Adam Hayes. Coming on next week. Mm-hmm. So uh, this will be an exciting one. I mean, anybody that's in the whitetail space, there are certain guys you know that kill big whitetails consistently. Don Higgins is one of those. And I believe, I mean, I'm pretty sure he's, um, I don't say like married to, but uh, he's an Illinois guy. That's where he hunts. I don't know how much Don even hunts out of state of Illinois. Yep. That'll be a question to ask him, but the dude just kills big bucks. And so, you know, we're not going to get him probably to share his secret sauce necessarily, but I'll be interested to see what he does. Because again, going back to what we've said, you know, for how long now can't kill a big buck if he isn't there. You know, so is Don growing these big bucks or is he finding these big bucks? Like that would be an interesting piece to to figure out. But um yeah, Don Higgins is on the Hunter Podcast this week. Awesome. Excited to learn from him. Let's bring him in. Hey Don. Hey Don. Hey, how's it going, guys? Doing good, man. We appreciate you being on the podcast today with us. Um as we kind of just talked about, we had that big front that kind of moved through the whole country or most of the country you know, here this week. And, you know, it sounds like as soon as that was Dude, swinging through. There was a tornado warning last night. Did you I see saw it? that. Did, did any touch down? No. Okay. No. I didn't think so. Mm -mm. I kind of laughed at it when I saw it. Yeah, we don't get those very often. You guys get tornadoes out where you're at, Don? Oh, yeah. We don't get as many as like Kansas and the Plain States do, but, uh, you know, we get them every year. Huh. Yeah. So. So, Don, um, obviously kind of a no introduction for most of the people listening to this podcast, but but just for kind of a recap, you know, uh, kind of give us your background. Obviously, Jared and I were talking with you before the podcast here, um, involvement in real world, obviously the Chasing Giants podcast. I mean, the list kind of goes on, but but give us a give us a top down, I guess, on on kind of some of the things you got your hands into. 
Wow. The list is long. So, <laughs> uh, um, basically anything that I can do to keep from getting a real job and, and be in the hunting industry, I've pretty much done. So, uh, you know, about, uh, 12, 13 years ago, I started real world wildlife products, a company that, uh, you know, specializes in wildlife food plot, seed blends and, uh, deer nutrition products. Um, then, uh, well, I, I've got a consulting business, um, consult with landowners on their whitetail properties. Mm -hmm. Uh, last winter I was in, I was on 83 properties last winter, wow. all the way from Kansas to New Jersey. Jeez. Um, then I hold a whitetail master course on my home farm and, and one other property where basically students come in and, uh, how about half the time is spent, you know, in front of a PowerPoint presentation. And the other half is uh, spent on these two properties. Uh, one of them is my home farm. The other one's a farm that I've hunted for years, decades, really. And uh, we go right to some of the stand sites where I've killed some of my biggest deer. And, you know, I kind of explain why I put my stands there, how I use the wind, how the buck is using the wind or the bucks are using the wind. Um, those are probably uh, the Chasing Giants podcast that started a couple of years ago as uh, it just continues to grow. I've been an outdoor writer for this past uh, summer. It was my 25th anniversary of my first article published in North American Whitetail. Wow. Um, got a couple of books out on hunting trophy whitetails. Uh, basically, if it's got anything to do with land management for whitetails or hunting whitetails, I've got my hands in it somehow. <laughs> like I said, anything to keep them getting a real job. I hear you, man. And you know, the, the cool thing is, and, and for anyone listening that isn't familiar with Don's even hunting background is, you know, the ability to do all of these writings and, and, uh, you know, classes and education processes, because you kind of, you kind of have the credentials, the show for it, right? You're out there putting those actual methods to the test and, and successfully at that. In fact, last year, uh, you know, you, you killed a, what, over 200 inch last year in Illinois? Yeah, I, I shot a, uh, well, it was a gross 221. He ends up netting uh, 197 and 3H typical. Um, actually, is the number six typical of all time in Pope and Young now. Wow. Uh, and then I Can we followed pull that up, up about a month later. I shot a 185 inch buck. But uh, yeah, well, you know, the thing is, though, that I really try to stress, you know, every time that I have an audience, whether it be my own podcast, someone else's podcast or seminars or whatever, is that I don't think that I'm any better than anyone else or anything special. I think that, you know, anybody out there that's really serious about it can do what I'm doing. It's just that uh, if the passion's there in your heart, um, it's going to take some time. Don't get mm -hmm. me wrong. You know, I'm not at the same place I was 20 years ago, but if you keeps, you know, pushing towards your goal, um, you know, my goal was to be in the hunting industry and work in the hunting industry and make 100% of my income through my hunting. And I didn't do that till I was over 50 years old. You know, I wasn't, I, I've been working at it for a lot longer than that, but uh, I, I was actually, it's only been in the last two or three years that you know, all my income has come through the hunting industry. So wow. if you've got that dream and you've got that passion, you keep plugging away. I think anybody out there could do what I'm doing. But, you know, one thing that Jared and I constantly talk about, because I mean, at, at the end of the day, you know, we, we live to hunt whitetails and it's, it's very much in line with kind of your thought process of, you know, it doesn't stop. You know, and the, the off season isn't really an off season. In fact, we probably work harder in the off season than we do during the season itself. You know, but one thing that kind of keeps circling back for us um, is that, you know, it seems logical, but you can't kill a big buck if he isn't there. Um, and so I think it, one of the kind of the holes that I would like to, to dig with you out of the gate is, you know, when you're even entering this season, right, by the time this drops, uh, the Illinois season should be open, right? It's first week of October. Um, you know, what is your mindset? I mean, have you already kind of locked eyes on the buck that you're looking to hunt this year are you still looking for him do you expect him to show up but you haven't seen him yet i guess maybe walk us through some of that thought process for you well like you said it's a year-round process it never ends and you know one of my favorite parts of the whole process is running trail cameras and 
you know, like right now I've got trail cameras in three states. I counted up the other day. Uh, I've got trail cameras on 33 different properties. Wow. And it, it, it's the search. The hardest part about killing real giants is finding them. There you go. And th they're not easy to kill. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but the, I spend way more time trying to find them than I do really hunting for them mm -hmm. uh, once I've found them. So, um, you know, this year is kind of different. Last year, I knew that giant buck was around and uh, had him on my hit list. And I'd watched him grow up for the uh, previous couple of years before that. This year is totally different. I really don't have a, a number one target buck. Um, on the latest pod chasing giants podcast, you know, I, I told the listeners that I, I counted up. Somebody wanted to know how many bucks over 150 inches that I found this summer. Mm -hmm. And I found 32 different bucks over 150 inches, but only five of those will make 170. None of them will, will hit 180. Mm -hmm. Five of those will make 170. Four of those five are four-year-olds that I have no intention of shooting. Those are the future giants a year or two from now. Yep. The last thing I want to do is shoot them. They made it this far. They're, they're that close. I, I want, won't let them get a little older, you know. So I've got one buck that is uh, 170 or better that is at least five years old. And I'll definitely put some time in hunting for that buck. But the other thing is I drew an Iowa tag for the first time this year. Oh, wow. And they got permission on a, I think it's a pretty decent farm in Iowa. Now, I haven't got a picture of a giant there yet, but uh, this farm kind of sits right in the middle of three different big sanctuary areas, a state park, a big industrial complex. It's almost 2,000 acres where no hunting's allowed. Wow. And then a big private timber where no hunting's allowed. So I'm writing this, this triangle. And each of these properties is only separated by about two miles at the most. Yeah. And, uh, so I, I know I'm in a good area and this farm has got all summer long. I haven't got much for buck pictures. I've got one buck that's probably in the one sixties and another in the one fifties, but I, I just got to feel I'm in the right spot. I don't have any past history to go on yep. other than, you know, word of mouth, what people tell me. So I'm kind of banking on, on a decent buck showing up there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I told my listeners on my podcast the other day that, uh, my goal for this season is just to, to shoot one buck over 170 inches. If I can do that with what I've got to work with this year, it's going to be pretty successful. Yeah. It, it's really cool for me to hear the breakdown of how many properties that you're covering with trail cameras, how many bucks you've gotten and, you know, all the way down to ones that you would consider hunting. It just paints a, a pretty accurate picture. I think of how hard, uh, you know, them big deer are to, to find, let alone to yep. kill. hundred percent. Well, I, I don't think that people realize how much time and effort it takes to, to shoot these kind of deer year after year after year. I mean, like I said, I, I'm in three states this year with cameras mm -hmm. because I drew that Iowa tag, but I'm always in at least two or three. And, you know, I had a property that in Ohio that, that I was hunting last year. So I, I had cameras in three states last year, but um, I'm covering a lot of real estate. And in the Midwest, I think... Uh, 150 inch buck is fairly common. Yeah. You know, I, I mentioned that I've got pictures of 32 of them and I've got cameras on 33 properties. So, you know, an average of about one buck per property is going to hit 150. Now, yep. some of those properties, I don't have a single 150 and another one I might have two or three, right. but it averages out to about 150 inch buck for every property. But when you start talking about 170 inch deer, that's a whole different ball game. There is a lot of miles between 170 inch buck and another one. Yeah. And I think that's the big thing. I mean, and again, part of it, and this is no knock to, to just hunters in general, but first of all, most people don't know how to score deer, especially visually. Right. I mean, how many guys drive by a field and they're like, man, I saw a 150 last night in that field. I'm like, no, I've seen that deer. He's 130. <laughs> you know, it, that's number one. But then to literally be able to get eyes on a 170 <laughs> and then be able to make a hunt on Dude, them. I, I hate to do this. I have to throw my dad under the bus. It was a couple of weeks ago. He called me. He's like, Jared, I just saw a giant on our place. He's like, I was like, how big? He's like 170. I was like, <laughs> this is Eastern central Ohio. I was like, no, I was like, dad, I was like, dad, you know what it takes to make a one? So he put a camera up and like two weeks later, we get a picture of this, uh, 130 <laughs> 135 and i was like is this him he's like i think that's him <laughs> i was like uh but you just it's because this is such a passionate hobby lifestyle that you know 
People just get worked up, you know. Same way in the stand, like you could t- a yeah, guy, yeah. a guy could tell you he's going to sit. Oh, in the dude, stand. my dad's not the only guy. Yeah, and I've been there too. And past three year olds all day long, the first big three year old that comes chasing a doe in, he he shoots, yeah. you know, and doesn't and he doesn't even realize that he's like big Man, deer. I don't know, yeah, big it's deer, just big deer. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a tough aspect. It is so when you talk about those those states, you know, and there's different properties done. I think it's. Some people would be like, you know, almost discouraged by that a little bit, but I think it's just really expectations of it's hard to grow a 170 inch whitetail just is. Uh, no doubt about it. You know, and you know, one, when it comes to storing the bucks, you know, one advantage I've got is I've got several on my wall that to compare them to. Mm-hmm, yeah. So if, if I see a 10 point buck, I, I've got, you know, I've got a couple of 10 pointers on my wall that score right at 150, 153. And then I've got uh, three or four that are right there about 170, say from 168 to 172, they're right there. So I can look at a buck and I'll I'll compare it to a buck I've already killed that I know the score of. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how I estimate it. But uh, you guys are absolutely right. You know, the uh, tendency of hunters to overscore deer is just an (laughs) amazing. It's miraculous. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's bad. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And I mean, to be honest, you know what nine out of ten deer you'll never get your hands on so you won't know but by this group by looking at it you're kind of like all right yeah listen that's not a that's not a 150. (laughs) i think what's maybe even more discouraging than those numbers is how many future booners i've seen at two and three that just disappear yeah dead never to be seen again like yeah. for like for sure, like mid one fifties, three year olds. I get that was going to be my next question, Don. Kind of as, as you look at um, these properties across these states, and and just your history, even hunting these different states, have you seen a progressive increase or decrease in the number of let's say five year old and older bucks uh, in the last few years? It, maybe just subsequent to that. What what states are we talking about here? Illinois, obviously. I, Iowa, Iowa, I assume, is the other one. Yeah, and you know I've hunted in the past in uh, Ohio. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, I was hunting in Ohio back in the in the nineteen eighties. Yep. And now I don't hunt there every year. Um, I owned a property there, which I just sold this summer. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think Ohio is a real sleeper state uh, for giants. But uh, <laughs> yeah, right there through through the heart of the Midwest is, is basically where I'm talking. Indiana, I've got uh, yep. cameras in Indiana each year. Yeah, uh, Indiana, the management, you know, approach there is, is not quite as good as it is in Ohio or even Illinois. So, mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, th- that's basically the region that we're talking about. Cool. Yeah. So th- I and guess back to your question. As yeah. Far it's as just kind of what you're seeing in that age. And again, it varies year to year. Like maybe you have an EHD outbreak that, you know, takes out some deer or, or maybe you don't, but um, I guess, what are you kind of seeing in terms of those numbers of mature deer that that five and older class, especially? Well, you know, I can go back quite a few years farther than you guys. So, uh, <laughs> got a few more gray hairs here in the beard. I'm, I'm 28, but, uh, Don. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've got so, some gray. You know, I remember, uh, 30, 40 years ago, <laughs> a guy w- would shoot a 125, 130 inch buck and it was newsworthy. I mean, there were very few of those bucks killed in any county in the country. And uh, the management has just gotten better and better. I think some of the the uh, state game agencies, um, I, I've got a theory behind it, but I, I don't think they're managing for the older age classes so much anymore. And I think it's got to do with CWD. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, it's been shown that uh, the older mm-hmm. males are, are the ones that are most likely to contract CWD. And so I think these really? state game agencies are trying to cut back on the age structure. Um, that's just my theory. I can, nobody said that, but uh, just based on some of the management decisions I've seen from them, I, I kind of put two and two together. But, you know, it's really the the private landowner who, who just continues to step it up and take it to the next level. Mm-hmm. And we just see more and more of that with each passing season. And, and there is no doubt it's having an effect. If, if you've got, you know, a few landowners in a, say a township that are really managing, they're, they're going to save some of them young bucks and they're, they're going to move them on to the older age classes where they're going to get bigger. So, uh, 
you know, I think it's real important that if we want to continue to be chasing mature animals, it's not going to happen through the state game agencies. We're going to have to take it on ourselves as, as deer hunters and land managers and do what we can with our properties. And it's going to have some effect. And, and I can see it's already having an effect. It just seems like each passing season, well, if you look at it like five year increments, right. You know, today, if you, if you look back five years, I, I think we're, we've taken a substantial step forward mm-hmm. as far as whitetail management on private properties. And, it's a trend that I don't see slowing down at all. In fact, if anything, I think it's gaining steam and we've got more and more serious deer hunters jumping into it and it, it just bodes well for the future. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think to tack on to that, I, and again, we, we've kind of talked this about this in the past and nobody wants to be the guy that says, hey, like we don't want hunters, but there is a decrease in the hunting population that's happening, whether it's just because of aging population or not as good of recruitment in certain states. So I think as you get more serious hunters and overall, you know, you get less hunters in some of these states, you know, that is posing a situation that is better to get older age class deer. Yeah. And, you know, I've seen the the mindset of hunters change over the years too. I, when I was your age, I would see during gun season, there would be trucks parked everywhere. Yep. There would be deer drives going on. You couldn't look across the countryside without seeing orange dots everywhere of people sitting in trees or putting on deer drives. And today, you know, in my area anyway, during gun season, I'll, you know, take a break from bow hunting. And we, we just have a, a short uh, three-day gun season here. So I'll take those three days off because I don't want to bump bucks out of my hunting areas and get them killed. Mm-hmm. And I'll just, you know, go for rides about daylight and, and dusk and, you know, just see, you know, where the hunting pressure's at and things. And I, I literally don't see 10% of the trucks and the hunters sitting around that I did say 20 years ago. Yep. And as far as deer drives, I know there's still some deer drives that go on, but nothing to the extent it used to be. And there's nothing more deadly on young bucks than deer drives. <laughs> no. So I, I do think at least a percentage of that pressure surely probably a large majority of it has just kind of fallen off or whatever but some of it i think is transitioned to the, the archery season whether in form mm-hmm. of crossbow or transition sure. to a, a true compound bow yeah no i would agree with um, that you know and I, I look at a state like where we're at don we're in pennsylvania right traditionally i mean growing up in the in the 80s and 90s like i mean it was it was like that you orange army everywhere you go and it's still a ton of pressure but the fact is it's not nearly, I mean, we're 300,000 ish less hunters than we were in the mid nineties, you know, and because of that, you know, people are killing, you know, 160, 170 inch deer, a couple one nineties killed in Pennsylvania two years ago. I mean, those deer never appeared, you know, in years past cause they were shot at two or three. Yeah. And you know, I, I spent some time in Pennsylvania last winter and I was on some fantastic, you know, looking properties and I don't see why you guys can't continue to, to raise the bar and, and shoot more bigger bucks than, than you have in the past. And in fact, I think it will happen. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that just the, the way the state's going and it's just, it's inevitable, right? We're, you're not going to sustain a million hunters year after year after year, right? It eventually starts falling off and, and that's kind of where we're at. And to your point about CWD, I mean, we've got it in the state. There's definitely been a lot of changes that, you know, whether people are in support of them or not, like have affected deer populations, especially in the central part of the state. Um, you know, we've had some EHD in the past, you know, four or five years in the southwest part of the state. So there have been things that contributed to, you know, herd reduction, which seemed to be the big kind of Achilles for Pennsylvania for so long is, you know, growing up when I was a kid sitting with my dad, like we'd watch a herd of 50 deer come through and there'd be a spike in the group of all does and fawns, you know. Mm-hmm. We may not see 50 deer in a herd now, but I'll go out to any soybean field in the, in the summer and see multiple, you know, two, three, four year old bucks. And that was never the case. Hmm. I think Jared really hit on something when he said that the transition, you know, has been from, from gun hunting to archery. Um, that's what I'm seeing here, you know, in Illinois as well is the crossbow had a big impact on that mm-hmm. as Jared mentioned, but, uh, this year for the first time probably our archery harvest is going to top our gun harvest wow and they've just been coming closer and closer together each year and last year the gun harvest was just barely above archery this year i wouldn't be a bit surprised if archery doesn't surpass gun hunting 
That's uh, crazy. That is crazy. Totals. Do you know what that looks like in other states? Or do you Not know? even close, usually. Yeah, I didn't think so. But they also have a short, shorter gun season versus, like, we have a 10-day, 12-day gun season. Missouri's got 14 days. Yours, yours is just three days? Two, three days? Yeah, we got three days in November, and then we have a four-day season in December. Mm -hmm. wow. So seven total days broke up, you know, into two different seasons. Don, this might tie into your CWD question. So Jared and I, we, we typically go out and hunt Kansas in uh, November. We didn't draw this year. Uh, uh, part of what we're talking about here is just a huge wave of hunters going in and applying in Kansas, which, you know, just limits the number of permits that are going to be successful. So instead, we're... Um, we're Somebody gonna... told everybody Kansas is a good state. <laughs> I don't know who it was, but we're going to find them. Yeah, we're going to find them. <laughs> um, so we're, we're going to be down in um, uh, Pulaski and Union County, Illinois, uh, hunting the okay. second week of November. And one of the things that we were kind of discussing is, you know, again, it seems like Illinois has and probably will have great deer hunting for a long time, but... It's very easy. It's over the counter, right? And just go by. There's a lot of public, you know, private, you know, it's expensive to lease, but you can lease ground. Do you foresee that state ever becoming more Kansas or Iowa-esque where, you know, at some point there's a regulation around how many people are coming in? No, I don't. You know, Illinois is famous for its liberal politics or infamous, maybe. Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the politicians see the Illinois deer herd as nothing but a, a money source mm -hmm. and they're not about to limit that income. In fact, if anything, they'll probably raise the prices and, and, and still leave the door wide open. Yep. If they thought they could get a thousand dollars for a tag and, and not lose hunters, they would do it. Hmm. They, they want to maximize the revenue. They don't care about the deer herd. It's all about maximizing the revenue. Yep. Seems like it would be an easy, I don't want to give them any ideas, here, but it seems like they could just open up the gun seasons a little more and increase revenue substantially. Well, I, you know, in Illinois, it's we have big bucks, I say, in spite of the DNR, not because of the DNR. Yeah. And the DNR is, you know, they're basically controlled by the politicians. So I'm not, you know, directly blaming IDNR and the biologists because I know their hands are tied to some degree for sure but it's the Illinois politics that's basically ruined the Illinois deer herd well, and uh, as far as a statewide the, the management of statewide now what saves Illinois is that we have so much private ground yep okay. and, and you you get these landowners that and the short gun seasons that, mm -hmm. yeah short gun season does help because in but, contrast but you, you got like Missouri is open about the same yeah you know just longer gun season mm -hmm. you get a landowner that doesn't allow any hunting whatsoever well that's a good thing because his property becomes a sanctuary for growing bigger deer yeah 100%. And, and you mentioned missouri you know here, here's what i always found really interesting about missouri probably the three best states for whitetails in the whole country are iowa kansas and illinois mm -hmm. they all surround missouri <laughs> yeah missouri sits right in the middle yeah Poor management's what it is. It's a long rifle season, as you mentioned, Jared, in, in the middle of November, and, yep. and that just kills them. Just crushes them. It, and it's the same way with Indiana, really. Indiana's got about a three-week gun season right in the middle of November, and, and they sit right between Ohio, which I, I think Ohio has the potential. If they would change one regulation, Ohio would be the number one state for whitetails. Which one? But the allowing the, the baiting. There, there's so many young bucks that get killed over bait piles. 100%. I'd be up for they that. They would just eliminate if they'd eliminate that bait pile. Ohio would, within three years, be the number one destination because mm. they got a one buck limit. Yep. And they got a gun season in December after the rut. Yep. yep. You feel and, the, uh, you feel the same way about Kansas? Um, Kansas, but but Kansas is limiting their hunters. Right. Where Ohio is not. Yep. Um. That's fair. And I'm not saying I'm for or against baiting. I'm not even sure. taking a side yeah, in that. Irrelevant. Argument. It doesn't matter to me one way or another. But if Ohio would do that, they would jump right to the top. They'd surpass Iowa. Yeah. Isn't what? What? <laughs> I I kind of well, we, we have somebody, and I'm I would agree with that as well. We just had so Ben Rising is a friend of ours and mm -hmm. was on the podcast recently, and like. Great guy. Same way. Ben is a great guy. He loves to bitch him out about the baiting in Ohio, yeah. though. And and I understand why, because he grew up hunting Ohio and had a lot of success. And he, in his opinion, 
which I would agree with, is that the the more baiting has has caught on and picked up, he's like, dude, you can't find a, a deer not on some kind of a corn pile pattern on somebody else's property. That's it. Yeah, guys are just bringing truckloads in and just and, dumping. And, and while I enjoy the benefits of baiting as someone who hunts Ohio, I, it's pretty clear to me that if that had, if that went away, we'd have bigger deer and more of them. Yeah, and I mean, I like it. I, I mean. I'd have no problem saying like, yeah, I'll hunt over bait. I use bait for my cameras all the time. Like, I, I don't care if it's legal, go for it. That said, I mean, I've tried to hunt mature bucks over bait. It's freaking hard. It's not easy. It's hard. <laughs> it's harder than uh, without it. Yeah. Well, even if they would just eliminate, I mean, I'm a fan of supplemental feeding. Yeah, yeah. for sure. I know some people aren't, but I, I'm a fan of it. So I just think they need to eliminate it during hunting season. That's it. Sure. Yeah, I was just, I think I was telling, I don't know, Strauss this morning. It's like, I, this is just the easiest way that I could put it. It was like, a uh, corn pile is, especially if you get like uh, something sweet on top of it, is hard to beat as far as attractability. Mm-hmm. But I would say it's very easily beaten in terms of huntability. Well, I mean, there's been research done, and, and given it's in the South and, you know, every property is different. But a lot of the research will show that if you continue to bait, like let's say through the season, eventually the amount of daytime movement you see is just non-existing because the deer knows it's there. It's relying on it. It can come whenever it wants. Yeah, maybe that's true. But I mean, dude, I can't tell you how many times I've had a daylight pattern on a buck on a corn pile that I've never seen in person when I went to hunt him. Mm -hmm. I just, it just seems I, eventually I hope I'll learn. (laughs) Yeah, I'm gonna try it again this weekend, you know. Yeah, but uh, they're just they're really tough to kill on them corn piles. I think I think the other thing that I've seen at least, and and you know, Don, I'd like to get your take on this is that it, it, not so much in like early season or summer, but as you get into fall, is those big mature bucks don't want to be around other deer. They no. just they don't want they don't want to be at a corn pile where there's three other two year olds here and a one year old up in their grill like they don't they don't want to do that stuff until like Thanksgiving week they get stupid because they're, the hungry. Yeah. <laughs> they're well, hungry they're no, hungry no because they get the last dough coming into yeah. the corn piles yeah Don knows what I'm talking about <laughs> oh yeah um, <laughs> you, you know the corn pile is not decimating mature bucks it's decimating young bucks that's it i mean th- there's a lot of guys sitting on those corn piles that'll shoot yearlings oh 100 percent. and the guy you know he might have three yearlings coming into his corn pile and he shoots one because ohio's a one buck limit state so mm-hmm. what's he do he calls his buddy and say hey you know i got these bu- two bucks coming into my corn pile every night well then he shows up and he shoots another one of those yearlings and it's the young bucks that they're wiping out and they're preventing a lot of deer from getting to those old, older age classes. And, you know, Ohio has got fantastic genetics. They've got genetics as good as any place in the country. Yeah. It's just that, and the ones that get to the older age classes, a lot of them are giants. Yep. If they could move more of those young bucks into the older age classes, it would really, I mean, I I think Ohio would blow away. Iowa. Hmm. My property's a, perfect picture for what you're talking about we're just talking a minute ago about how many just crazy good two-year-olds i've got even one and a half two and a half some of them make it three three. yeah just stellar box it's like man my dad killed a two-year-old a couple years ago with like two drop tines five inches each just perfect heavy gnarly like just crazy crazy you've got a couple 153 year olds this year and so many of those deer just go they just get killed just go messing yeah yeah and unlike the buddies Again, we were just talking earlier. I, for us, it's it's we're bordered by some Amish, and uh, yeah. it's kind of like the one shoots, the next one they fall to the side, the next one does. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a row of them, <laughs> but they knock them down for sure. It. I think that the the state regulate when you start to look at okay, Ohio, that baiting rule goes away. It's really good. You know, in Missouri, I think it's a combination between the rifle during the rut and the ability to kill multiple bucks, which possibly could even, I mean, what do you think, Don, uh, Illinois could look like had it only be a one buck state? Well, I remember in the late 80s, early 90s, Illinois was better than Iowa. Hmm. It literally was better than Iowa. It was the best state there was. But then, you know, the non-residents discovered Illinois mm-hmm. and Are you the blaming Illinois the politicians dis- <laughs> discovered the, the non-resident money yep. and the floodgates open and outfitters. I mean, I remember when there was no outfitters in Illinois. Yeah. Now I'm talking, you know, probably late eighties. Mm-hmm. Um, and at that time, you know, Illinois blew away Iowa. 
Wow. Just blew them away. It wasn't even close. But as the commercial hunting, you know, the, the outfitters popped up, the non-residents were not limited. Yep. Um, it just destroyed the age structure is what it did more than anything. And, you know, Pike County, I just said on my last podcast that, uh, I think Pike County, Illinois is the most overrated place on that planet. Um, I've done a lot of work in Pike County. I've got open invitations to hunt multiple properties in, in Pike County for free. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't drive across the state to to sit in a stand there because it's, it's living on its past reputation is what's happening. And more and more people are opening their eyes and see it, man, this place isn't nothing like what it's supposed to be. And, And so the, the outfitting and stuff in that area is kind of it's catching on with with non-residents that pike county is not what it used to be hmm. and uh, the whole state really isn't either but but it's not bad it's kind of what's holding its own is the fact that that more private landowners are getting involved in, in managing their their properties yep and that's what's holding illinois where it's at now but uh no no help from the state whatsoever yeah, it's an interesting thing. I do think I don't see gun season increasing. Number one is even though Springfield runs Illinois, like think of Chicago, you can't even have a freaking gun in that city, you know. So I don't see them increasing that opportunity of gun hunting. The other thing I think that's a lifesaver for Illinois right now is like you guys still can't use most center fire rifles, right? It's muzzleloader shotgun during gun season, right? You know, not given the new modern muzzleloaders and stuff are shooting 500 yards, but still it's not guys walking out with a 30 out six or something like that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, I I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, Illinois seasons just become more and more liberal. Mm -hmm. I mean, they added the crossbow, they added a a youth season, which I'm a hundred percent for, but, but they added a late winter season for uh, antlerless, uh, harvest they just keep adding seasons and uh it, it's all about the income at the same time yeah. i think the insurance lobbies tied in pretty tight with the legislators sure. so um you know they want to keep that deer herd in check to to cut down on the deer car collisions um, which cost the insurance company money mm-hmm. um, i wouldn't be surprised if at some point that we rifles are allowed. I mean, Indiana just recently Saw started that. allowing rifles. Ohio so I too. Be a bit surprised if Illinois doesn't at some point. Yeah, Ohio did. They also added a season, like a late gun season. Yeah, I saw that in couple, January, couple of years ago. maybe. Yeah, so yeah, just a weekend. It it is weird when you start to look at that kind of how all of those different things factors come into play for one single thing, which is we just got to get bucks to an older age class. Right. In, in most cases across the yeah, board, it's not complicated. Yeah. It's just difficult. It's a lot more difficult than people think. And, and we're at an advantage right now, per what Don's saying, more private land, more private landowners involved, less hunters, right? What you, we talk about that being a negative thing, but if you're trying to grow bigger bucks, less hunters is what you need. Less, I mean, hunting pressure is the number one killer of a big buck. You know, that's, what's going to do it. And so if you, if you start to look at these things, like we're set up to do it right, but there are some things, bait in Ohio, bait in Kentucky, bait in Kansas, that are killing these two- and three-year-old, which will be future 170 pluses. Yeah. Just how it is. And, you know, the, the baiting issue, again, I, I don't have a, a dog in that fight because it's not allowed in my state. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I, I guess one thing that would irritate me if I lived in Ohio is – you could be just an awesome land manager. You know, you could provide the best habitat, the best food plots and, and and spend your entire year working towards that. And your neighbor goes out a week before season opens and backs up a dump truck with a pile of corn and boom, there goes your deer. He, he's done nothing for the, the species. He's yep. done nothing for the habitat. He, he's contributed nothing back to conservation, but he's there reaping, the reward. And, and that's kind of, you know, the, the thing that, that, that really gets me about it is it, it allows people to, you know, in this world, in all aspects, whatever we're in, involved in, there's givers and there's takers. Yep. And, and, you know, a land manager is a conservationist. He's a giver. He's providing food for not only the deer, but all the other game, he's providing habitat 
you know, he's the guy that's out there planting trees, whether they be fruit trees or, or timber trees, you know, oak species or whatever. Um, he's providing browse on his property for, for game and he's given back. And then yet some guy backs up with a dump truck and in 30 seconds, he just, and annihilates everything that guy did in a sense. I think yeah. uh, Don just recited your life story. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> it, that's, it's, it is. I mean, Ohio. Is, that's right. But seriously, again, and it's no. That is the problem with baiting, I think. It's, it's a little unfair to people who are just investing. Well, see, and I do both. Like, I, I do all that stuff. That yeah, we supplemental about. feed year round, but, you know. And if I see the opportunity to bait and kill a deer, I'm sure going to. Um, but there's some other things like w- it, let's take a lease. So we've got a lease in uh, near Jared's farm too that we're hunting for the first time this year, and we've done a lot of work on it, um, and we've we've fed for you know several months on it. But literally, there's a guy next door who brings in like a triaxle of corn and just dumps a big pile in the middle of the field yeah. and in a single spot, th- thirty tons a year of corn. He, really? Yeah. He got and I talked <clears throat> to him. He's quite a piece of work. You know, we're trying to invest. You know, in in conservation, we're putting different pl- like the turkeys, you know, pollinators, yeah, and everything, you know, and like good things to be said for him is he he hasn't stepped foot on his property aside from that box blind in six years. Yeah, so it's I mean it's not pressured, and he can only kill one buck. So I yeah. mean whatever. Yeah, but still, if he's got thirty ton of corn just sitting there, if he's not hunting, that ain't doing us any good either. No, I don't know though. I mean, we just. It seems like he's got his own little deer herd and they just stay there. And our deer are just different deer. Like he doesn't have pictures of our deer and we mm-hmm. don't have pictures of his deer mm-hmm. for whatever reason. Like those yeah. deer just seem to have grown up and they live and die by that corn. That's why none of their antlers look very good. Mm-hmm. Um, they're just, I don't know. Yeah. Classic. In case. the interest of full disclosure, you know, I mentioned I had the Ohio property. <laughs> I did have feeders on that property, you yeah. know, during season. Sure. Oh, yeah. Um, I didn't dump corn piles. I prefer to have it in a feeder, keep it out of the weather and, yep. and that. And, uh, but I had three feeders on, uh, I forget how many acres the property was about 160 acres. We had, a, a about 20 acres in food plots and then we had three feeders as well. And the reason for those feeders more than anything was that if the neighbors start dumping out corn, we want to be able to compete with it and hold some deer too. Yeah, it's a cl- and, and that's the thing that I see in, in Ohio. I spend probably more time in Ohio than any other state except my home state of Illinois when it comes to consulting. And what I'm seeing is guys are baiting because they feel like they have to bait. Hundred percent. If they don't, the neighbors are going to have the deer, so they've got to. Yeah. yeah. Frankly, that's what I kind of feel like in Kentucky too. Like yeah. I'll, I'll go. I've got a place in Kentucky that I'm at every two weeks. Sometimes there's larger gaps if I've got to work more. But if I go three or four weeks and I don't fill my feeders up, it'll take two weeks for the deer that have been on my property to come back because they'll just go to somebody else's. You know, and it's not that I want to keep buying feed. It's expensive, right? But if I don't, it literally, they'll just be off the property. Now, eventually, they'll come back to and rut and stuff. But if I'm trying to protect those deer, there's no way. Can't do it unless I'm feeding. Were you in, like, the southern part of Ohio, Don? Yeah, I was. I was in Pike County, not far from uh, yeah. Waverly. I, yep. I was real close to the town of Waverly, Ohio. Yep. Gotcha. I'm more like Eastern Central. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And we've got, I've got a place in uh, right outside Columbus. I'll be hunting this upcoming weekend. Which and is the, a killer spot. Cl- I mean, classic. It's not that it's any better. We've got, jeans, a, two, we've got food, a 200 there. But it's I cause 200. those bucks get old because it's right outside of Columbus. There's nobody hunting. You know, and so if you get in those areas that like there's a state park sanctuary right next door, oh, uh, dude, what they better, just live there? What better example than those Seek One guys? I mean, killing. Yeah, there you go. Genuine booners every single year, like in people's backyards, because they don't get hunted. Yeah, yeah. I I think that you know, just kind of reflecting on what what you talked there about how much ground, how, how many acres would you say ballpark those thirty two ish farms that you're covering are total. Wow, that's a, that's a tough one, but uh, you think it over over three thousand acres, over five thousand acres? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, some of those properties are actually public hunting areas too. Sure. So I'm not just looking on private farms. I'm looking everywhere I possibly can to find a giant. And if I can get permission to stick a camera somewhere, I'm sticking a camera somewhere. Yep. And uh, <laughs> no, yeah, it's it's 
thousands of acres, no doubt about it. I think that, you know, at least what we saw in the southern part of Illinois, we've got a couple small leases down there, but frankly, some of the public that is near the leases seems to be, at least for bow season, better ground than even our leases in some cases, just the way that the terrain or the funnels set it's up. Habitat. And stuff. It's just so thick. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just islands inside thousands of acres of crop fields. Yeah. I jokingly said it seems like that's where the term swamp donkey originated from. It's freaking gnarly down there. Yeah. And it is cypress swamps. Yeah. 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 And I think that's where, and I don't know, I mean, maybe with the, the guy who is hunting a little harder, it, here's, here's where you get kind of two angles of it. I think there's guys like us who, if somebody says, Hey, you got to walk two miles in and there's a little Island there. And if you get onto that Island, you're going to find a giant. We'll go there. There's also the serious hunter who will spend as much money as possible to manage his property, but that's where he lives in that bubble. He doesn't, he won't go outside of that bubble to go find a big deer. You know, it's either there or it's not. And so I think it's kind of neat when you compare those two, because you've got guys like I think the three of us who, yeah, you tell me there's a potential for a giant. I'll go put a camera there. Or I'll go hang a stand there. Don't get, well, don't get me wrong though. Like if, if I had the opportunity to, 100%. to own the ground and I, and I knew there was a 200, a giant there. Yep. That's where I'd be. But if you just have that piece of ground and you invest in it. And, and they're not, not there. Yeah, you got to get somewhere else. But I don't think, I think a lot of these guys aren't. They're just going to hunt what they have. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's nothing oh, wrong with that. I agree with that. that. You know, but. I see that with my clients all the time. It, yeah. And I get it. You know, I, I have, it's more satisfying for me to sit on a stand uh, on my property. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm watching deer that i provided the habitat for i provided the food plots and to see the watch those deer utilize something that you created yep there's a degree of satisfaction there that you just don't get you know plopping yourself down on a permission property or yeah. public land 100 percent. yeah and i think that's the and again you know no knock to those guys but if you want to kill big deer consistently you got to burst that bubble you got to get outside of it yeah i mean it's just it's just being versatile like it you can you can manage for deer you know for years and years and just depending on where you're at what the hunting pressure is how that fluctuates you just might not have a deer to hunt every year mm -hmm. and so i'd say like i ideally every you know every, every hunter has a piece of ground that they can call home and they can invest in and that they can be hopeful for but if that doesn't turn something up you know i mean if your goal is still to kill a big buck like you have to go to where they're at sure i mean that's that's the reality mm -hmm. I think one thing I'd like to kind of flip on its head here and go on a management attack a little bit is, um, you know, we've had a bunch of other guys on the habitat side, Jeff Sturgis, we have Bronson Strickland, Mississippi State. We've all kind of, everybody has their, their kind of viewpoint on how to, let's say, build out a property, especially when it comes to the nutrition side of it, you know, and, and Jeff's a guy, not that he's not going to provide nutrition um, during the summer, but because he looks at the Midwest a lot and says, well, you know, there's a thousand acres of soybeans here and 500 acres of corn here. You know, he really optimizes food plots and plantings for the hunting season to draw yeah, those deer his, in. His like term that he's coining and applying to that is called the herd influencer. Mm -hmm. And so like, you know who Jeff Sturgis is, right? Oh yeah. It's his, it's his opinion that he shared with us that, um, you know, basically whatever October to January or whatever months it is, basically the hunting season is a hunter or land manager's greatest opportunity to influence what that herd is going to look like from, from year to year. And, you know, we took that conversation and stemmed it all the way down into what types of food plots he's yep. planning, what his hunting strategies are, et cetera. I think where you're going is you'd like to know what Don's opinion is on, on that. Or Yeah, essentially, if you're looking at it from whether it's your own property, Don, or a client property, in particular areas that, you know, maybe aren't all ag, but you've got ag around you. Like, you know, what would be your approach there to say, here's some of the things that from a planting or, or management level that I would want to do to sustain so that property? Maybe a really literal example of that is he doesn't plant beans. Doesn't at all. Uh, yep. And his reason is... Uh, I don't need summer food, which I think uh, completely overlooks the the winter aspect of, you know, of beans. That's but, what I want to get into with Don is, is just, yeah, because I think a lot of people think of beans and they're like, oh, I don't need summer food. Yep. Well, if you leave them standing, you extend. Exactly. So that's, that's kind of where I wanted to get at, Don. Well, it's ironic that uh, I, I think soybeans are, are my favorite plot. They, they're my favorite plot, hands down. 
but I don't even look at them as a summer food source. Hmm. You, yeah. you, you talk about properties in ag country. That's exactly where I'm at. I mean, I've got literally thousands of acres of soybeans, corn, whatever around my farm. I, I don't have to provide summer food, but I, I think as a, as a land manager trying to maximize the potential of a property, first of all, I want food sources there 365 days a year. And secondly, I want those food sources to be as diverse as possible. So in, in my plots, you know, I want to provide the grains from soybeans and corn um, throughout the entire winter. I'm not just looking from October to January or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for until spring green up. If a deer shows up at my place to spend the winter and he shows up in October, I don't want him to have to leave in January because I ran out of food. Right. I, I want him staying there and eating the best food he can possibly find anywhere until spring and then what happens on my place is the deer you know i don't have bucks on my place in the summer uh, occasionally i'll have a year and a half old buck you know wander through or something i've got a handful of doe resident does that stay and they have their fawns here but in the fall as the crops get harvested and as hunting pressure picks up a, around my farm you know out two or three miles out as as that pressure picks up and as those crop fields disappear deer just slowly migrate into my place and I, i've got more deer on my place the last day of season than i do at any other time hmm. and even during the rut i've got bucks showing up late that were not there during the rut and the reason for it is because they know they can always find food there hmm. and one theory i've got is that you know my place is like the premier property in like the township let's say so all the deer in the surrounding areas, they know when food gets scarce, where do they go? They go to Don's farm. Go to Don's place. <laughs> and uh, you, you know, what I think happens is a lot of those does, I mean, I'll have, you know, basically more than half of the deer that are in this township will live on me in the winter. Wow. And those does come and they bring their fawns. And, you know, you know, we know how buck fawns disperse, you know, when they get about a year old or so. Yep. I think what happens is even like my resident does, the fawns they have, I think those bucks disperse. And then when rough winter sets in you down the road, that buck may be three or five years old or whatever. I think he remembers where he had plentiful food during the winter as a fawn. Cause I see these bucks show up in the winter that I have no idea where they come from. And, you know, I have cameras, not just on my property, but I've got cameras surrounding my property miles around me that I talk about, you know, I don't have bucks here in the summer, but I have the same bucks coming back every fall. Well, I know where them bucks summer at because I find these bachelor groups that are out away from my farm a mile, two miles, whatever. And I'm getting these bucks pictures in velvet and then boom, they show up in the fall. Hmm. But then I've also got these bucks that, that show up in the winter time that I have no idea where they came from. I didn't have their picture in the surrounding area in the summer when they were in velvet in their bachelor groups, but, and they were not there during the rut, but boy, when the, actually they start showing up about the first of December, you know, when the ruts tapering off yep. and those bucks really get back onto the feed, yep. I start getting new bucks in and it's to the point where unless I get a chance, we, we're allowed two bucks here in Illinois. And I always want to keep a, a open buck tag for the late season because I have no idea what's going to show up. Hmm. Now, if I get a chance to shoot two giants, I'm going to do it. Sure, sure. But before I burn that second buck tag, he better be something pretty special because I, I want to have something, you know, you know, a tag left because I have no idea what's going to show up later. But, you know, when I talk about diverse food sources, I'm not just talking about food plots either. Now, my food plots, I think I counted up the other day and, you know, I had like over 15 different plant species in my plots. Um, you know, a dozen of those come from the real world's deadly dozen blend, which is a fall planted blend. Of, it's got cereal grains and brassicas and such. But besides that, I've got, you know, clover, alfalfa, I've got corn and soybeans. And, and then on top of that, I've got the, the mass trees. Yep. So I have, you know, I've probably got, I don't have any idea. O over 10 different varieties of apples. I got pears. I got crab apples. I got chestnuts. I got persimmons. Uh -huh. Persimmons are not common where I'm at at all. Now, you get south of me just a little bit. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a lot of them. But I'm kind of like on that 
that break uh, cutting point, you know, where north of me, there's hardly any south of me. There's a lot, mm -hmm. but I, I've got a bunch of persimmons on my farm. And I, I just think year round diverse food sources are very important on, on a whitetail property. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, how, um, you know, I think one thing that, and mainly because it's not as common as obviously like hard mass, where you're talking about, you know, acorns or something like that. But when you talk about your soft mass side of things, do you see that being, um, you know, a, a big attraction point in that early season or, or, you know, when do you see that use the most, I guess, from, from the deer that you're looking at? Most of it is early season, to be honest, October. Yep. Um, I mean, they're hitting them right now. Um, but our season's not in, I mean, they'll start in September say, but, uh, yep. through October for sure. I mean, if I would go out and look underneath any of my fruit trees and I, I don't even know how many I've got on my property, but you know, dozens, if not a hundred, there's probably very little, I could probably put the fruit that's on the ground in my hands. Yeah. They're just cleaning it the up. They're just cleaning it up as, as soon as it falls, they're there every day to clean it up. Yeah. I think it's important. You know, a lot of people I know will get discouraged. Um, because they're driving around, they're seeing bucks, you know, in, in that September time period, right before the season starts, you know, and, and they get frustrated, like, man, I'm not seeing anything, but like, they have to realize like, you know, if, if it came push to shove, I don't want to see the buck in September. I want to see him in October, November, or December, right? I don't care if I see a, a shooter, you know, through July to September, but I want to be ready in October, November, cause that's when it counts. You know, and I think that a lot of people kind of get down on themselves and they're like, well, you know, it's uh, next next week's the opener. And I just, you know, I haven't seen a shooter yet. And it's like, yeah, that's fine. They're going to be changing here real soon anyways. So mm -hmm. don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think people would be absolutely shocked <laughs> if they knew how few bucks I have on my property from, say, about the first of April through this time of the year. They're just now starting to show up. I mean. I, the biggest bucks that'll be here on my place this fall are not here yet. Yep. And, uh, you know, it's people get the idea that these bucks are, are staying on this property year round and they're not, I mean, but when they do show up, I've got everything here to keep them here. And when I talk to my consulting clients, I always talk, tell them to, uh, think of your property as one square on a giant checkerboard. Mm hmm and you're in an airplane, you're 30,000 feet up, and you're looking down at your property, you've got one tiny square on a giant checkerboard. And you need to do everything you possibly can to make that square the best square on the whole board. And, and that means making it different than every property around it. Mm -hmm. And having all these diverse food sources is a good way to do it because, as I just explained with the persimmons, for example, you know, my neighbors don't have persimmons because they're just not in this area. Right. Or if they are, it's very, very rare. Chestnuts. I've got a lot of chestnut trees. I don't know if any of my neighbors have chestnut trees, apples, pears, whatever. And, and it goes right down to your food plots. I want something growing in my plots that the deer can't find anywhere else in my neighborhood. you got to make your square different than all the squares around it. And diverse food sources is a great way to do that. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. I mean, uh, you know, and I know a lot of guys who have good bucks on camera right now and two things. Number one is they'll set all their stands or all their sets to where they're seeing bucks right now. All of a sudden those deer move off these crop edges and start going into the timber because acorns are falling and, and deer are moving back into that stuff. And the next thing they know, they're like, yeah, I'm not seeing anything. I don't know where they all went. And it's like, there's a, there's a habitat shift here mm -hmm. and you got to pay attention to that. I mean, if you don't, and you're still hunting summer food sources in October, like you're shit out of luck. <laughs> it's just the way it is. Yeah. I know that, uh, a lot of, a lot of the stands on my place, like we, we used to do that a lot. Like I, I've got probably 30 stands hung on this, you know, thousand acres that we've got in Ohio. And, uh, I mean, we've hunted all of them a, a fair amount and some of them are, you know, good rut stands, but like anymore it seems like i've gotten to the point where it's like i just don't i'm not real i wouldn't consider hunting any of them except like the known rut spots mm -hmm. like those seem to be the only ones where like a fixed position tree stand is like makes sense to me anymore mm -hmm. um just because like their pattern seems to vary so much fr from year to year and from from buck to buck depending on food source and what what any specific deer is doing um they're just kind of there to you know appease the guys that are hunting hunting our property and stuff yeah. but 
I mean, even that deer this year that I've got on a pattern, it's just, it's very situational. He showed up a week ago and I'm gonna hunt him out of a saddle just cause mm-hmm. that's, I can get in there and do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think as you start to look at that kind of transition and, and even what you're seeing Don from, you know, now through October to December 1st, when all of a sudden all these bucks that, you know, some of which you've never seen before are getting sucked into the property, you know, people, and, and it's, and I get it right as much as we prepare for this thing year round, like we've got essentially 12 weeks, like that, that's what it is. Here's the 12 weeks. And if we can't get it done in those 12 weeks, season's here and gone before we kind of like a hurry up to wait, hurry up. Now it's here. It's like, okay, let's wait and see how it unfolds. And I think people just get impatient, you know, and I think that's, I think that's part (laughs) of the reason that some of these younger bucks even get shot from guys who say that they want to hold out is because like all of a sudden it's Halloween staring you in the face. You're like, man, like, you know, am I really going to pass this deer if it comes in? And then, you know, yeah. that's just where it goes. But I think if you have a complete property set up, kind of like what you're talking about here, Don, like you extend some of those chances. I mean, for a lot of guys, the moment you get past November 15th, I mean, it's kind of a downhill roll from there, you know, especially if gun seasons have kicked in, like all of a sudden it's high pressure, like you can't find these deer, food sources are, are limited, you know, but if you're managing your property to be ready for that winter time period, like December could be a better time to kill a mature buck than October, November was. I think that, I think my property will be better this year, like throughout the fall than it maybe ever has been just because of the food that I've got established there and stuff. The mm-hmm. years of TSI I've been doing, um, I, I just feel like it's got better fall and winter habitat than I've, I've ever had. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm optimistic to see what we'll, we'll pull in this year. Don, you said when we were talking about this earlier and just uh, saying that your camera's lighting up, um, you said you were using cell cams. How much have those changed the way that you hunt um, throughout the year? Well, this fall will be my 44th deer season. And in 44 years, the biggest game changer I've seen in deer hunting as far as success is uh, a success on mature bucks is the trail camera. Absolutely hands down. I'll be the first one to admit that I wouldn't have nearly the big box on my wall if it wasn't for trail cameras. And what they do more than anything is they make me or allow me to be so much more efficient with my time. Right. When I'm sitting in a tree, I know there's a shooter in uh, somewhere, you know, I'm within the range of a shooter, the home range of a shooter buck. Mm -hmm. And before the trail camera, it, it was all a matter of scouting, glassing, looking for shed antlers, you didn't, I mean, you could have somebody tell you they, they seen a giant, but what's one person's giant? I mean, that hasn't yep. changed. Yep. Yep. And <laughs> you had to physically either see the deer yourself or find his antler, or there would be just a small core of people whose word you trusted. And that's the only way you knew a giant existed. Mm-hmm. Well, today, you know, I mean, look at me, I've got 50 trail cameras in three states 24 hours a day, those cameras are my eyes telling me what's going on. And it, it, trail cameras are the ticket. If you're going to, I mean, I don't see how you can kill giants on a consistent basis without them. I agree. Yeah. I, I mean, I know personally prior to even the cell cam side of things, which I don't know, we've been using cell cams four or five years now, probably. Yeah. You know, I 100% checked cameras and was just in the woods moving or checking cameras more than I hunted in the fall. Just because I was always trying to find how how to get the most recent information to stay up on, you know, what was happening. Because if I go and check it four weeks later, like, great, he was there four weeks ago. What good's that do me now? Well, and, and what I'm doing is quite a bit different. And I don't know that I've heard anybody really talk about it to much degree. Is you know, with all these cameras, you know, I'll find a young buck, a three year old buck, for example. And I may not hunt him until he's five or six, but I'm picking up on his habits. You know, when, when is he showing up at a certain place? Mm-hmm. And I, I actually wrote an article back in 2003 titled Same Time, Same Place. It was published in Peterson's Bow Hunting. And in that article, basically, I, I detailed how I noticed that the tendency of bucks to show up in the same place on almost the exact day, definitely within 48 hours year after year after year. And, and, you know, like when these bucks, when a bachelor group breaks up and a buck leaves the bachelor group to to head towards his fall range, I guarantee you that year after year, that buck is going to do it within 48 hours. If he leaves his bachelor group on, you know, September 3rd, 
next year he's leaving that bachelor group on either the third or the maybe the second or the fourth, but it's within, it's real close to the third. And I've seen it even with these bucks that show up on my place late in December. When they show up, you can mark it on the calendar. That's when he's going to be there next year. If he's still alive and he does show up next year. Um, and the trail cameras basically tell me when they're showing up. It's not my observation. It's when I get his first picture next year, I'm going to get his first picture about that same day. And uh, so I- I'm using my trail cameras to put together a, like an annual pattern on a buck um, before I even hunt him, years before I hunt him. So, you know, I've killed three different bucks on the first morning I ever hunted for them, mature bucks. Uh, the second buck I shot last year, the 185 inch buck, first day I ever hunted for that deer and I shot him in the first 15 minutes. But I'd ran trail cameras on that property for the previous three years and had an idea what he's going to do. And I think most deer hunters don't use their trail cameras to their their most efficiency. They're they're always a step behind. They go out and they check their camera and, oh, he's in daylight now. He's hitting this scrape in daylight. Um, It's time for me to start hunting. No, you're a step behind. You should have been there when that (laughs) buck was there and you got his picture. Yep. So what I'm doing is I'm using this intel from previous seasons. I try to stay a step ahead of him. So, okay, I got him on this scrape, you know, last year on November 5th, first time he hit that scrape, I get my stand there. I stay the heck out until November 4th. And then I start hunting that, that buck at that location. And uh, I think everybody wants to use that intelligence they gather from the trail cameras immediately but it's used a lot better a year down the road. Interesting. I got two, two things <laughs> yeah. uh, real quick. The, the date for me, Don, that I've seen on our place is October 18th. Seems to be the the one day that I can overlap, and it's in a specific spot down there at the pinch, pinch too. Yeah. yeah. Um, the yeah. other thing is just a comment about trail camera uh, information versus, like, intelligence and actual information that it provides. Like, I think I see a lot of guys running trail cameras that get pictures of stuff, but that they don't understand what it means. Like they they don't know what to do with it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, from all the way from they don't know how old the deer actually is to how to even hunt the how deer. to interpret yeah where he's coming from, where he's going, why he's at that specific location. And so I think you know trail cameras. I agree with you. Are uh, especially cell cameras are one hundred percent like the, the most recent information is what kills deer. But you have to know what to do with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only. Uh, exception to that might be a, a corn pile because well, you can get lucky yeah, yeah and i mean even i think with a cell camera to don's point you're still a step behind you know and i saw that last year I was, yeah I was well hunting, unless you're a year ahead yeah which, i was yeah. hunting a 170 inch deer in pennsylvania last year which is few and far between and and i knew date wise i'm like it's 20 yours is the 18th mine's like 23rd 24th i've killed several bucks on this property mature bucks on that day and i there was a front coming through on the 23rd so i picked morning of the 24th to get in there and damned if he wasn't walking by evening of the 23rd and you know got his picture but too little too late right yeah. didn't see him the next day so i think that that's a really good point and and i mean you know i know i've stored camera pictures for years and years but most guys i mean check the camera and eh, there's a couple good bucks maybe send them to the buddies boom format the card and they're on like i don't even they don't even do keep the information do you know anywhere. do you know I, I don't mean to jump in ahead of you don if you're gonna say something here i just what I do is like I save all those pictures and they're on my phone gallery. Yep. And so just as often as I'm like up, updating my, you know, my stealth cam app now to see new pictures come in, I'm scrolling back to see what happened a year ago today. And in the upcoming week, I'm like, what was happening? Mm-hmm. And then I go to the year before that. And I like in real time, like right now I can go back and tell you what was happening on September 23rd, 24th and 25th last year and the year before and kind of make some assumptions about like, oh yeah, like that, that box might show up over here or I could do mm-hmm. this. I could do that. I think that's a good point. Yeah, I, I store my my camera or my photos by location. So all the photos I get at a certain location or on a certain property are, are stored in one folder and, and then I can and they're on chronological order, you know, as they were taken. So, you know, I don't I, I'm one guy that don't think it's possible to age a buck by a picture, a mature buck. I'm sure you can tell a young one. But what I can do a lot of times is you know, a buck shows up that I'm interested in all of a sudden, and uh, maybe he threw on 20 inches from the year before. Well, I go back through that file and I see, well, there he was the year before. Oh, yeah. Well, there he was the year before that. He was obviously a two year old that year, which makes him a four year old now. 
And if you hear me throw out an age of a buck, it's because I've got history and I can go backwards to at least when he's a two-year-old. I mean, you can tell a two-year-old and a yearling. 100%. But once they get to three, it becomes a whole lot harder. Oh, and no. uh, having that history and, and by location makes it a whole lot easier. And, you know, there's a really a, a great tip for every listener that's listening to this podcast today right here. If you're hunting a buck this fall and you have his trail camera picture from a year ago, just look at the dates on those previous um, photos from last season and you know where those were taken. Well, that's where you need to be this season at that date. So, I mean, that's something real simple that, that anybody can do. It seems so logical, but I would say most, including myself sometimes just, uh, you know, I, I get too wrapped up in the what's happening now and not the what had happened last year. Well, and uh, cause I don't think it's, you can't like uh, take it as Bible. Every, sure. Every he's not going to do literally exact same everything. You know, food yeah. sources change, different does come into yeah, front, and weather stuff. fronts. Yeah, there are definitely variables to that, but there's definitely a percentage of overlap. I, I don't know, Don. What do you think it is? Like twenty percent of the time, he's going to do exactly the same thing he did last year. Well, I, I think it's close to one hundred percent of the time he's going to be in that area. Sure. So. That doesn't mean he's going to walk by that camera. Sure, that you know, makes sense. Like you said, wind directions are different and everything else. But it, it's very, most of the time, he's going to be really close yeah, that's to fair. where you got his picture. Interesting. <laughs> hey. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's kind of, um, it, I think that's one thing that, and we've talked about it before, you know, I love trail cameras. I mean, again, I I don't know how many cell cams we're running. Too many right now, but not enough at the same time. Um, we're, we're coming up on you. I think, what do we got, 30 or 40? 30, 30 or 40 uh, in like seven or eight states, though. But I think that one of the things that, you know, you have to keep in mind is there's still a large chunk of hunter instinct, intuition, groundwork that has to be put in play there because I've well, over hunted the information on my trail cameras too much and missed opportunities. It, yeah. It's the same thing I'm saying about not being able to read the, inf like you still have to have some intuition and just yep. apply what you know about deer to actually hunt them. Mm -hmm. You know, the trail cameras are a great piece of information, but they don't tell you everything. And it can be pretty humbling to see from a stand, a mature buck just walk right behind it. And you're like, Oh, never, <laughs> never yeah. would have got pictures right. of him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, don't take what I said too literal. I mean, if you see a buck's picture, you know, from a year ago, that doesn't mean that he's going to be right in front of that camera, Sure, but he's right. going to be close. I guarantee he's going to be close. And I think that's the important thing. Cause to go back to the beginning of this conversation, can't kill a big buck if he's not there. So at least if you know, he's around and you're in the area, well, hell man, you're in the game, which is all you can hope for anymore. Yeah. 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 I think that's a big one. How about, um, and I know we've obviously gotten some decent fronts coming through here recently. When you kind of look at the overall aspect, if we look at that single, you know, block on a checkerboard, you know, obviously food is a huge piece. Um, how, how value do you have cover and water in that equation? Well, covers number one, it, it trumps everything. Yep. Freedom of human intrusion ruins more properties than anything. So you need that cover without human intrusion. Got it. Yeah, agree. <laughs> and so you, in in a lot of cases, you're putting that cover ahead of food. Uh, for sure, because a mature buck, that's what he desires more than anything is security. Yep. He can wait till it's dark and he can walk a mile to the food. But when the sun's up, he wants to be where he's safe. I think that's a big piece <laughs> of kind of what we've talked about here in the past and that like, you know, for a lot of things, um, people look at food and what they're providing on that, but maybe their, their woods are wide open. They're not doing any kind of TSI or they don't have warm season grasses or whatever it might be. And the fact is, is you, you're not going to provide what that buck needs. Like maybe he passes through your property or maybe he comes and feeds on it, but it's in the middle of the night and he's heading a mile back to the bedding after that. Yeah. Just that lack of human intrusion is, is tough to find these days. Like even on so the place that I hunt, my parents live there and you know, they run a, a ministry and stuff. And so they always have people over and um, it, it's their property. And so obviously they're going to use it however they want. But I think there's a, an undeniable effect that it has on the, the deer population there. Well, and yeah, I mean, I think it could, whether it's just from driving around, yeah, whether it's human pressure or just people, yeah, you know, hunting pressure, people are at. yeah, they just don't, they don't want to be around that. 
you know, unless they're in suburban Columbus, Ohio, and then yeah, don't care. that's that's true. They're just used to it at that point. Yeah, um, well, they're pretty adaptive. You know, they'll they'll find that little pocket where the, there's no human intrusion. It it may not be that big, but it may be in some guy's backyard. But yeah, they'll find it. Yeah, I I think that one thing that you know people overlook, especially, and we've had this conversation a lot, is even when you have everything right, let's say covers there, foods there, you feel like you've got the strategy right. The way that you get in and out of your stand or your spot is so critical. Um, and, and to the point where I've seen guys that have some of the most beautiful properties I've ever seen that have big bucks on them. And, you know, they'll ride their damn UTV within a hundred yards of their stand and then walk in and I'm like, what are you doing? Like, you know, and they just, that's just how they are. See, I'm, I'm undecided on that because I know guys like that that kill big gear. And maybe it's because they just, they do that frequently enough. Maybe it's, I don't, I don't seem to know. Like there, there seems to be a few different schools of thought, you know. And I mean, it's the argument of, is it, is a vehicle or UTV or ATV less intrusive than people? Yeah. I would say yes. What are your thoughts some on, cases. on vehicle intrusion or done? Well, access is everything. Yeah. Um, if you don't have access, good access, you don't have a good stand. Now, you know, a, a tractor, UTV, whatever, is not going to disturb a deer as much as somebody walking. Yep. And uh, but the thing of it is that, like on my farm, I'm always riding around on a four wheeler side by side, a tractor or something. But on the when I go hunting, it's not like that at all. I'm slipping in undetected. Interesting. Because a, a, you know a big buck, he may just lay there and let you drive by on a tractor, but you've alerted him enough that he's not going to stand up and move before daylight or before dark while it's still daylight. Mm -hmm. So even though you didn't bust him off of the property, you might cause him to stay in his bed later than he might otherwise. Here, here's my dad's theory, and it's one that I do. I actually I like it. Um, so it's, you know, big bucks are obviously aware of these tractors and stuff, mm -hmm. but they, they can't necessarily count. <laughs> um, so like if you can drive in, have somebody drive you in on a tractor or a vehicle and drop you off once they're past the point, the field of view of that deer and then drive back out, you know, that deer's like, oh, okay. One in, one out. Good, <laughs> good to go. I agree with that a hundred percent. Yeah. yeah there, there's no doubt about that. I think the drive well, in I and park is the, the, the error. Right made you know let me drive in here i'll you, park you need a tuck and roll method yeah yeah well and i mean i i think it also to don's point about walking through i mean that's that's the other thing and it it you know in several of the spots that i hunt you know depending on the wind it'll be a different access in you know or i just can't get into that spot mm -hmm. right if it's if it's this wind i just can't access that because it's going to blow right back into this bedding area and i think a lot of guys may even think that they have a clean access but they'll just regardless of when they use that same access right. in and out, um, you know, and oftentimes they don't even know it, but they're just messing it up. Spot's done. You know, that's why I probably I've killed most of my mature bucks on the first sit or a hanging hunt period, not frequency. I think deer hunters are quick to jump to conclusions too. They'll see something like one time <laughs> they're rutting. And if they see it one time, well, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll give you an example is that uh, mode paths. Yeah. You know, deer will follow a mode path. There's no doubt about it. Deer will follow a mode path. Mature bucks will sometimes follow a mode path. I've seen them do it. But there's been two different bucks that I hunted that refused to, to walk a mode path. And one of them was Smokey, the buck that I, I shot to, in 2017. Um I've watched that buck more than once cut across the mode path, but he would not follow it for anything. And, uh, you tell somebody that, you know, bucks don't, I, I tell my clients, don't be mowing paths instead <laughs> go in with a sprayer yep. and, and spray a path. Yep. Those bucks, there's some bucks that, that want to feel that, that brush or those weeds up against their side. Sure. It just makes them more safe. Now you could mow a path and still kill mature bucks but there's a certain percentage of them that you're not going to kill on a mode path. Yeah. And I want to do what I can to kill the highest percentage I possibly can. So instead of mowing paths, I will spray paths where those deer, I, I can lead them wherever I want to go with that sprayed path, 
but there's still those weeds that are right up against the deer's side that that'll just about any mature buck will follow that. And that's just one example. Mm-hmm. You know, we was talking about access and how you want to access. Yeah, there's some mature bucks that you could drive out there, you know, with a, you could land with a helicopter and, you know, blow the leaves off every tree in the woods and drop a hunter off and take off. And here he comes, it's time to eat. He's coming to the food plot, but there's also going to be a percentage of them that are going to tuck their tail and crawl under a log and they're not coming out till midnight. Yeah. So, uh, we got to be careful about observing something once or twice and thinking that's the rule for all mature bucks because very that's, seldom is that the case. That's good advice. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, it sounds like Don and, and don't let me put words in your mouth on your strategy there, but <clears throat> using, <laughs> yeah, using your kind of back history with a lot of these deer, you're, it's not like, Hey, it's October 1st, open a day. I'm in the woods. You're very selective on the days that you hunt specific deer. Correct. Yeah. You know, today I, I mentioned earlier, it's my 44th deer season and I'm as crazy about deer hunting as anybody you're going to meet but I probably hunt less today in a season than I ever have in my life. But I probably spend more time preparing to hunt today than I ever have in my life. And a lot of it goes back to those trail cameras telling me when and where I need to be. And uh, a lot of it's just experience too. Um, You know, you, we learn as deer hunters, you know, overall traits or whatever habits of, of mature bucks, but, each property you got to learn as well. So, you know, it used to be said that you really don't start seeing the best bucks on a property until your third season hunting there. It takes you a couple of years just to figure out where to get your stands, how to get your stands in the right tree or what tree you need to be in. And, you know, to this day, I'm still learning my own property and, and I'm fine tuning things every off season. I'm fine tuning things just a little bit to throw the odds in my favor just a little bit more Mm -hmm. and it's a never ending process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's something that, you know, uh, growing up, I mean, I remember, you know, the day before the opener, it was like Christmas Eve, right? Like I couldn't wait to get out on whatever it was end of September, early October for the opener, you know, and you just go sit the stand and, you know, sometimes you'd see something, maybe saw a few does, maybe you saw a good buck, but it, it, you know, to now where it's like, I'm very like almost, in some cases over critical of, all right, here's where this front's coming through based on history. Here's what this, here's the two days I'm going to hunt. And maybe they're two weeks from now, right now, unless something changes from cameras, like I'm, I'm just not going to hunt. Like I have no intentions of doing it. Maybe I'll take the kids out cause we're hunting one and two year olds or whatever. But at least for my sake, you know, I just, I know when I'm going to start hunting. And most of the time it's the 22nd, 23rd of October is typically the first time I really go after something. I'm curious, uh, I'm curious, Don, what, so you've got all these trail cameras running and relying a lot on those, uh, to determine what days you're going to hunt are, are a majority of those on would you, scrapes or how do you have those laid out so that you get the best information possible? Um, it, it's a lot of them are on scrapes, but, uh, you know, funnel areas, you get some kind of terrain feature that funnels deer movement. Uh, in the summer, I'm, I'm focused mainly on food sources, mm-hmm. uh, where the deer are entering those food sources, mm. um, because here in Illinois, we can't bait or yep. mineral out or anything. Um, but yeah, pr- probably right now, most of them are, are on funnel, funnel areas and scrapes. Interesting. See, I have a hard time like, uh, getting away. And this is a negative of the concept of like, this camera has to be on this one distinct point that this deer is coming to like a, a scrape or a, a corn pile or a mineral. And like, I've always had trouble justifying not putting a camera on something like that to put it on, you know, even a funnel where I know they're, they're using it. Mm-hmm. That's something I probably need to look at a little more. Well, I think again, Just buy more cameras and have them on both. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Talk to him. Yeah. <laughs> Jerry buys the cameras. Well, I think that that kind of goes back to the, uh, the fact of you talk to a lot of guys right now and, and, just via trail cameras, a lot of these guys will tell you that they're seeing less bucks. And I would say I'm seeing more bucks now, but two weeks ago it would have been flip flop, right? Cause none of my cameras were sitting on ag and entryways into these bigger fields and stuff. I was sitting on scrapes back in where the acorns and the terrain is. And now all of a sudden I'm starting to feed in deer that I've not seen before. 
And those guys are losing deer. They're not seeing anything that they were seeing two weeks ago. And, you know, this is the adjustment that has to be made as deer hunters, right? As like the season approaches, I'm not, I'm not scouting and hunting for deer in September. I'm scouting and hunting for deer in October, November. So you know, even when we were out in Illinois in July, we placed all of our cameras for what we think would be best in October, November. So from July to a couple of weeks ago, we didn't see shit. Yeah. <laughs> there was nothing, you know? And it's like, man, like these things have been out and all of a sudden, just like that in the last week or two, oh, there's a nice buck hitting a scrape. Oh, there's another good buck moving through. And so you just, I think that's where that hunter intuition comes in is, you know, you may only get out, to, especially if you're hunting out of state, you may only get there a couple times a year. You have to be thinking forward of, this might not be the best place now, but come October, these bucks are going to be cruising through this area. Yeah, I've got a habit or a tradition, if you will, of every Labor Day weekend, I spend that weekend shifting my cameras there you go. from summer feeding patterns to fall rutting areas. Yep. And uh, that's about the time the bachelor, the bucks are starting to shed velvet, the bachelor groups are starting to break up. And uh, it's about a month before season opens, so I yep. get in there and do that. And any disturbance, you know, is is forgot about a month later. So that yep. that's my Labor Day weekend tradition is I'm shifting my trail cameras. It's so surprising how many people just don't like. And I don't know if it's um kind of that invested hope of like, man, you know, they were there in August. Like, they're, he's going to show back up, and maybe he will, but surely not in any consistency because you're patterning him based on when these this entire 200 acres was green soybeans. Hell, by the time you hit the end of October, those beans aren't even there. They're picked, they're gone, you know? So I think it's just that mindset that, you know, get people in a rut. And, and frankly, they'll hunt those places. And then they'll be like, yeah, you know, I'm just not seeing anything. I'm just not seeing anything. And it's like, well, yeah, man. I mean, we know plenty of guys who will not hunt the woods. They will only hunt the edge of a field. That's just who they are. And, and frankly, half the time, like we're hunting in the woods and we're like, yeah, man, we're seeing bucks chasing and cruising all over the place. And he's like, yeah, I didn't see anything. I'm like, you're 200 yards from the truck on the edge of a field. Like you're not, not right now, at least. Well, you know, the deer's patterns or habits change throughout the season, throughout the entire year, really. Mm -hmm. And if you don't understand those changes and know when they're going to happen and uh, it, it goes back to being a step ahead of the deer or a step behind. You, you know they're going to shift from a summer feeding pattern to a fall rutting pattern. You shift your cameras before that happens, and, and then you're going to catch those bucks as soon as they show up into their fall range. You're going to catch them then instead of waiting for the buck to get there. Then you go in and put yep. your camera up and you put disturbance on the area. And I, I just I think it's really critical with, with these older mature bucks is that you got to be a step ahead of them. Yep. I agree. Um, want to look at kind of, let's go from this macro level of, all right, uh, let's say on a particular property, you've got a, you got pictures of this five-year-old 170 plus buck. As you start to think about where I'm now hunting that deer, um, on a micro level, um, are you looking mainly at terrain, wind direction, et cetera, or are you looking at, you know, sign on the ground, scrapes, rubs, et cetera, like that? Uh, you'd be shocked at how little attention I pay to sign anymore. Interesting. And, and, and I, I went through that. I mean, I was, I was a young hunter struggling to, to kill a two year old deer, just like everybody else has been through that stage. And, uh, it, when I was younger, that's what I was looking for. I was scouting, looking for sign. Mm -hmm. The more sign I seen, the better I liked it. And that's where I put my stand. Yep. And, uh, the older I've got, though, I, I've and the more experienced I've got, I recognize that today I, I put my stands based on terrain features more than any. Hmm. That's that tells me terrain tells me where to put the stands. Wind direction tells me when I need to hunt there, and wind and terrain is it dictates everything I do today. So it, I mean, I know Jared and I do this a lot. Like we'll pull up whatever, whatever your favorite mapping software is. Right. And literally we'll study an area to be like, well, I'm like, here's a saddle. Like this is clearly a point these deer across in here. Yeah. My favorite spot to hunt in, in, during the rut, especially, um, is the downwind edge of bedding cover because those bucks will just cruise that cover. They can use their nose to smell any doe that's bedding in there. They that doe could be a hundred mile or 
a hundred yards in, in the thickest stuff you could ever imagine. And if that buck's walking that downwind edge, he can smell it. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you can be right out there on the edge of that thick stuff on the downwind edge and, uh, that, that those bucks just cruise through there without ever following a trail. You may not have a rub, a scrape, or a trail in the side of your stand. And it takes a lot of faith to do that at the beginning, believe for me. For sure. It, uh, it uh, was a pretty tough move for me, and it took me seeing a few bucks before I really uh, accepted it as a, a viable tactic, you know, and, and mm -hmm. one that I really embrace today. But uh, I, I don't hesitate to put my stand where there's no sign whatsoever based 100 percent on the cover and the terrain i would assume that makes you pretty efficient at going in and being able to hang a set and get out of there without stomping around an area and really making your presence known right oh for sure yeah i mean when i go to hunt i know exactly the tree i'm going to it's not i'm going in and searching for a tree and i, I try to have for the most part most of my stands up way before season but there's always those situations you know where um you know, you get some intel on a buck or whatever, and you don't have a stand set for that situation, and you got to set a stand. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I do, you know, I know exactly where I'm going. Now, I may not know the exact tree, but I know within a few yards of where I'm going. And I think that's a big one because, like, even when we get into some new areas, and we've, we've tried to spend more time during shed hunting season or even in the summertime, but, like, the last thing I want to do in October to November is go into an area where I know there's a buck and then kind of have to like poke around looking for sign and thinking like, is this where I need to stand or should it be 200 yards this way? Should it be a hundred yards up this hill? Cause I mean, all you're doing is just dropping scent and disturbing the whole area. At least if I can go in and be like, Hey, by terrain feature, maybe I don't know the tree, but it's, there's a group here. One of these is going to be the tree that I'm getting into and I can beeline right to it, hang it and hunt it. Yeah, exactly. And then you, you factor in the wind at the same time, you know, I think a lot of people expect a buck to uh, commit suicide and be walking around and, and not utilizing the wind. And, you know, there was a an advertising slogan one company had years back, forget the wind, just hunt. Mm -hmm. Well, the buck don't forget the wind. I mean, I guarantee you, a mature buck does not forget the wind. And that's what I really show in my whitetail master course when these students come and, and we go to the stand sites. That, that's what the comments they made is that's what was the, the eye opener for them because I'm describing why that buck would even walk past that stand. Mm -hmm. You know, what would make him walk past that stand on any given day? And it's all based on the wind direction. He, he's walking past because when he walks past there, he's using the wind to his advantage to do this or that, mm -hmm. either to keep himself safe or to, to search for hot does and probably both. Yep. Can you explain to us, Don, maybe even in the month of like October, like wh what type of a scenario would you be looking for where a deer is using the wind to his favor that you can capitalize on? Well, the other thing is you, you gotta, you gotta have an idea where that buck is coming from and where he's headed to. It's not just, you know, when I started years ago, when I was a deer hunting, I would just go in the woods and wow, there's a nice trail here's a tree. I'll sit in this tree by the trail. Uh, the wind is blowing my scent away from that trail. All's good. Well, it, it's not because you got to figure how's it working for the buck. So in an early season situation, you know, you, you know, a buck is bedded at point A and he's going to, in the afternoon, he's going to get up and feed and the prime feeding area is over here at point B. So he's walking from point A to point B. He would like to do that with the wind at his advantage but if you've got instead of just a straight nose wind if he's got a quartering wind that's kind of hitting his his nose quartering into his nose that allows you to get off to the side of the trail he wants to use yeah he still has a quartering nose wind but there's no way he can smell you because you're on the right side of the trail where your scent's blowing away from that trail kind of down the trail but away from the trail. I'm with you. And that's exactly what I used last year on the second buck that I, I shot. Uh, now I've got a YouTube channel, um, Chasing Giants YouTube channel, and there's a buck on there, Joey. It's, I called the buck Joey. Mm -hmm. And I, I described, uh, you know, that hunt and on that uh, video and everything. But that's exactly what he was doing. That buck was coming down a trail, 
the, the wind was quartering into his nose and he almost caught my scent, but that, that trail turned and he turned. And when he turned, if he would have kept going straight, he would have hit my scent. But right before he hit my scent stream, he turned and that buck was doing everything a mature buck should to stay alive. He was using the wind the way a mature buck should. And yet I was to the side um, in such a way that he couldn't smell. Yeah. Man, there's some cool spots like that. When you, when you find them, it seems like you just kill deer there year after year, as long as that food stores remains. Um, I was talking with Jeremy even before the podcast. So in, in your situation where if we know Buck is coming from point A, uh, wants to make it to food source uh, B, if if C is, is us, the hunter, our setup, it seems like that buck will come from point A and parallel the food, you know, the food source B for as long as he possibly can on the downwind side. So he'd be on the eastern side, uh, you know, walking it all the way out until he feels like he smelled almost all of it. And if I can find a terrain feature that is at the very end, he's like, okay, I can see the end of this wood lot, and here's the food source I've been paralleling. I'm good. I've got everything covered. And he'll turn up right before you, and I'm in that last 20, 30 section, you know, sections of wood with the wind coming get a call from Remington, uh, you know, right out of the food source, um, even over into more bedding area below me and stuff. It doesn't matter. Cause that buck used that parallel trail mm -hmm. all the way out. And so he's good, but I've still got him. Yeah. And that's exactly what they do. And a lot of times these bucks, when they're coming back to bed in the morning, they know where they want to bed. And what I've noticed, I picked up on it years ago, just tracking a buck after a rain. It rained the whole night before, and I was going into a stand to hunt uh, one afternoon, and I seen a single set of big tracks. I knew it was a, a buck, figured it was a mature buck. And I just followed those tracks in the mud to see how that buck entered his bed. Mm -hmm. And it just, a light bulb went off, and it, I've seen it so many times since then. But what these bucks like to do is they know they want to bed somewhere and they'll run the downwind edge of that to, to scent check that whole bedding area. And then once they get past, they will J hook right back into bed. Yep. And if you don't see them making that downwind sweep of the area first, and, and you only see them after they've made the turn, yep. I mean, you're, you'll swear that buck's walking into bed with the wind at his back. And that's not what's happening at all. He's already scent checked and then made that J hook to come back in. And, uh, and then he can watch his back trail once he's in his bed. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I think when you start to look at, you know, and again, uh, evolution through the season, but if you think about that October time frame, like I killed that buck behind Jared was a uh, 162 inch deer here in PA. I knew where he was bedding and he was heading to a scrape that he had hit. And so my idea was if I could get him between them was in the evening, we had a big front through my basically the thermals were pulling my scent back behind me. But the way that there was just a slight wind is I knew if he came off of that, cause the wind had switched in midday when this front came through, but he had already bedded down. He was going to come off this hillside and basically make a cut right, a, right in front of me around the terrain to get to the scrape. And he did, you know, and you start to look at that and say, you know, okay, that might be in October. Maybe it's a food source. Maybe it's a scrape. Maybe it's both. And then as it progresses towards November, it becomes these bedding areas, right? And, and checking for does and downwind and stuff. And so again, just, you know, you got to break this thing down. And, and I think the hard part for most people, especially the people, it's no knock, not everybody can live deer hunting and management 365. You know, a lot of us think it so much year round, but you have to be so responsive in your thinking because you know, this week is different than next, which is different from the next week. Like every week is changing so fast that if you can't think intuition and, and respond, you're going to, you're going to miss out on opportunities. Well, I think as deer hunters, a lot of us get too hung up on beat down travel corridors, paths, deer yep. paths. And we go to the woods and we think, well, there's no deer path here. There's no deer. The, a deer, the only place a deer walks is on these trails. And if there's not a trail, the deer's not there. Well, that's not the case, especially with mature bucks. Mm -hmm. and uh, these mature bucks will walk right through the woods where there's not a trail, there's not a rub, there's not anything, but they're doing it with a purpose. They're doing it with the wind at their advantage. And there's a public hunting area, you know, not far from me that it's, it's, it surrounds a big lake. 
And the friend of mine is a very, he's probably one of the best deer hunters that's ever hunted that, that property. And he, he, I mean, he's really good. He, he play and he's playing the wind and, and he'll tell me that some of these bucks that he kills go to such an extreme to play the wind that they actually, he hears them coming splashing in the water because hmm. the, the wind is blowing out from the woods out across that lake. And, and those bucks want to get the wind to the umpteenth degree. So they will actually go out to the edge of the water so they can totally smell, hmm. you know, all that woods. Wow. And that, that doesn't surprise me whatsoever based on some of the things I've seen is a mature buck. He, sure. You're, there's going to be examples where they weren't using the wind, but if you want to kill them consistently, you need to figure out how they're using the wind on the properties you hunt. Well, and I think that's, that's it. it. It's one thing to be able to say, let me look at this stand. I think the deer are here. Here's it's a West Northwest wind or whatever. I'm in a safe spot here. It's going to blow back behind. It's a whole different, you know, look when you all of a sudden look downwind of that stand and you're like, there's 600 yards of, of possible corridor that these deer could be coming in behind you. And so just because you think you're safe because the deer are bedding up here, he J loops around you and he's easily downwind of you before you know it. Right. And they probably do that more than we even know. Because exactly. They don't always start blowing and snorting. Yep. A lot of times they smell you, they, they'll lock up and then they just turn and just gone. trot away or duck, tuck their head and, <laughs> you know, walk away or whatever. Well, Makes you wonder I how we ever we kill any of these things. We're winded. Well, and I think that that does go back to the fact that, and, and again, uh, for a lot of people, probably including the three of us, like there's a lot of luck still in this game, right? Of, of being able to kill a big mature buck, but it, it, you can do all the prep as possible. And, and there, are, there are people that just will get damn a hundred percent luck just that they kill a big mature buck because <laughs> we could go in and hunt that thing to a T and never kill them just because mm -hmm. that's just the way he is. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's, it's important for people to kind of understand that is that just because you finally have seen one, right. And the strategy to actually kill that thing is a whole different buck to get eyes on it. I mean, there's plenty of mature bucks that I've watched for four or five years. I've never even seen them in person. And it's not that I haven't hunted them. I've hunted them. I just have never seen the deer in person. Yeah. Well, I think that's pretty common. I mean, these bucks that I'm hunting, a lot of them, the Joey buck I just described, the, the morning I shot him was the first time I ever laid eyes on him. Mm -hmm. I had his picture, you know, for several years, Yep. but I'd never seen him. Yep. And I think that's, you know, and, and oftentimes I think probably that one time you do see him, you better make it count because that may be the last time you see him. And I agree with your statement on luck. There, there's luck involved in every, every buck that's ever shot, mm -hmm. including the ones I shoot. Mm -hmm. But what I found is the harder I work, the luckier I get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a good equation on that side. And and I think to that downwind point, it, you know, I think the trails thing has been something that probably all of us had kind of Im embedded in our brain from a, uh, you know, a young childhood of hunting. Like I remember, you know, being taught like deer would take the path of least resistance. And, and so of course that seemed like the mode trail or the beat down trail, but then all of a sudden you start to observe more, Dude, the more you're in the woods. I've seen some deer take some resistant paths. I watched that for sure. That buck that I shot in Kansas a couple of years ago, jumped off like a 20 foot fall cliff like into the river i have no idea how he got down it next thing i knew he's walking across the other side of it and that's what and it, you know i think that as you see that because i've had deer, for no reason at like, all i've been on the tree on the edge of a cliff that drops down into a creek bed right and i'm like okay like he's not going to get behind me damned if that thing won't just jump down in the creek bed behind me you know and it's like you you can't understand until and every one of those hunts makes us better right because you can't picture it or fathom it until it happens and you're like you know, yeah, no deer's going to come off that hillside. And it's like, well, I saw one do it last year and came right off and right up here. So I think that the more time they spend in the woods, the better. But you just have to make those sits count. And I think far too often, and I get it, man, I, there's nothing more than I love in the fall than sitting in a stand and hunting. But the more you hunt, the more you are in an area, the more pressure you're probably putting on those deer, whether you know it or not. Sure. And pressure just ruins more properties than anything. Yep. So. Yeah. And that's yeah, hard. That, that's why, I, you know, I say I hunt less than I ever have. It's because I'm picking and choosing my hunts where, you know, it's like comparing a rifle to a shotgun. You know, I used to hunt the shotgun method. You know, I, you pull the trigger and you got 200 and some 
pellets going out and mm-hmm. you're hoping one of them connects yep. where with a rifle you're, you're shooting one bullet and you, you got to be more precise um yeah kind of two different approaches i mean I, I had a good friend years ago that was the hardest hunter i ever ever met i mean this guy would go out opening day 90 degrees and he would sit you know from daylight till dark mm-hmm. every opportunity he was out in the woods sitting in a tree and i thought you know, sooner or later, this guy's going to kill a giant because he's just out there so much. He's bound to kill one just be- because the odds are going to eventually catch up with him. He's going to kill a giant. Well, you know what? That guy never did. And to this day, never has killed a giant buck because he burns out every, he burns out his stands and his areas. Yep. He's just in there so much. He burns them out. Hmm. Yeah. And, and he's I, lucky to kill a young buck. I think that's a tough lesson for people to, to process, to understand, like, you know, yeah, maybe that buck's in the area, but if the timing's not right, you're just doing more harm than good by getting in there. I hate that saying. You can't kill him from the couch so much. Yeah. That's exactly where I was going next with my next comment. I see <laughs> I that. mean, that's I it, it, right? Media. I get, it gets just so abused. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I mean, yeah, and the thing is, you sit on that couch long enough, and, and he knows you're there, you know, and that's what happens. I mean... Again, the the two the two oldest bucks I've killed in the state of Pennsylvania, I literally went in first time in the area, hang and hunt later in October. I mean, could I have went in and hunt, hunted those spots in October? For sure. But it there's no way. I mean, all I would have done was just put pressure on them. You know, the the one that I killed in Kansas last year on public land. Went in first time in there, sat it, killed them. You know, and I I I firmly believe out of anything that a lot of people will say you know, the more you hunt that stand and you're in the game, the better the chance. I think it somehow starts to decrease after sit one. That's just my opinion, though. I 100% agree. Yeah. Yep. It's just what I see, you know, and, and it's from personal experience more than it is what everybody else does. But, you know, I've killed more deer, more mature bucks, at least, on sit number one. Then it feels like when I start to go through the the year, like the more I sit that stand, I feel like my chances are slipping through. I don't know. No, there's definitely something to it. That first time in the stand is the best time. Yeah. And, and that's why I I want to be a step ahead of that buck. And you know, if if I go in there, if my trail camera history has told me a buck is going to show up at a certain place, say the first week in November. I don't want to go in there in October and I, I'm burning out the stand, you know, the does leave and everything yep. else and you ruin it before the, the time is right. And that's what I used to do. I mean, I, I've burned out more properties than anybody you guys ever met. I mean, I just ruined them because I just bombarded them with human intrusion. Mm-hmm. And uh, I finally caught on. And today I put so little pressure on a piece. And when I do go in and hunt, it's like you're almost hunting unpressured deer. Yep. I think that's a big point that, um, again, it's hard for people to comprehend because we all love hunting so much. Like we're literally telling you don't hunt. He's really making me want to get rid of that Ohio lease, <laughs> <laughs> but you, that landowners in there every single day, you know, cutting stuff. Just and, cutting I mean, there are, we do have pictures of mature bucks, but yeah. And I think there, there is a difference though, not a ton, but there is a difference between just vehicle pressure people in there and yeah yeah, hunting pressure (laughs) agreed um and it's not to say like on the november 1st if i go in to hunt a buck and like i don't see him that night that like i feel like i'm like i'm done like that's over i do feel like i've decreased my chances you know and that the next sit may not be as good yeah so i mean i guess i say this with far less experience probably than, than both of you guys certainly combined but um like when it gets to the rut especially like second and third week mm-hmm. of November, like I've seen a lot of deer get killed after a spot's been way over hunted and totally messed up. And it just seems like at that point, it's for the same reason that I think like, you know, a good stand is way more important during the rut than a pattern on a specific deer. Mm-hmm. The same way I think you get away with just time on that stand. Eventually okay. deer mess up and one will run by it. I guess that's what I was going to look at, Don. If we break down like, let's say late October to start, right? If you're hunting a buck and you're like, okay, uh, you know, this late October day is when In the I'm month of out. October, I couldn't agree more with you guys. Yeah. There's For me, it seems like there's a tipping point, whatever it is, like that first, second, whatever, whenever they're... For all day sits and just... Yeah, whenever repetition. you would start all day sitting at that point, like I feel like, man, it's hard to overhunt a spot unless you, you literally are bumping a deer out of his bed or mm-hmm. whatever, 
you know you're doing wrong. What What's your strategy there, Don? Like when you get into a late October, or is it like, are you still afternoon hunting mainly and, and kind of just planning your day out? Or I guess at one point, what point to Jared's, you know, comment there, do you start to say, all right, I just need to be in this spot and eventually he's going to make a mistake? Well, usually about the first of November yep. is when that starts. I'll start hunting mornings hard. Yep. And, uh, you know, the seventh and the eighth are probably my favorite days. There's more booners killed on the November seventh and eighth than any other dates. And that's that's when those big bucks are really cruising. That in most situations there's not a hot doe yet. And those bucks have built up to a fever pitch and those those big boys are now on their feet. They know it's just about to break loose. Mm-hmm. Um so I start a little bit before that. I get a lot of questions every year. You know, when's the best seven days of the, should I take my vacation? You know, yeah. I got one week of vacation and my standard answer is the best seven day period, I think for killing a buck is November 5th to the 12th. You want to get as many of those days in your week as you possibly can. Mm-hmm. And, uh, the, to be more specific for giant bucks, I think the seventh and the eighth are the two best dates. Mm-hmm. And then the second best time I think is Thanksgiving weekend at the end of November when the ruts winding down, um, those big boys know it's about over for another year. And, you know, they've been with a hot dough pretty much consistently for the previous two or three weeks. And they leave one hot dough after she goes out of heat, they go to look for the next one and it doesn't take them very long to find them. There's very little downtime from one hot dough to the next. Mm-hmm. But uh, as the rut starts winding down, that, that downtime between one hot dough to the next hot dough is longer. Yeah. And that's the period of time when that buck is vulnerable, when he's really on his feet moving, searching. Once he's locked up with a doe, he's tough to kill. Yep. It's that search between the hot does is when he's really vulnerable. And when you get towards the end of November, those search periods between hot does are a lot longer. And uh, that's a fantastic time. That's that, giant. that's that corn pile weakness time frame I was mm-hmm. talking about. Cause it's like, you've seen that a lot. In, they've in forgotten Ohio. about it at that point. They're just willing to just stumble right into a group of does surrounded around a corn pile that week in November. Just or whatever to check is, every one of them. Which unfortunately is first week of gun season for us. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, for whatever reason that there's that small window and it's not, huge but it's that 23rd to 27th yeah. or 8th that just J- jeremy and i've been camp oh you're talking still november no no saying? i'm talking october. october jeremy and i've been yeah. campaigning for the the 25th of october would be like your 7th of november yeah uh, but it has to correlate with a weather event it does and it's it's more of just having them on their feet usually hitting a scrape in, in conjunction if you've got a hot scrape that you've been seeing them on even if it's at night that's that tends to be where he is but you know, I, I've also seen um, the buck that I was hunting last year was the 23rd of October. I mean, he was all over a doe at that point. So very well, she had just Dude. come into estrus, like first doe in the area type of thing. I, I will also say, and maybe Don can put some pieces together for us here. After, and I've had some guys teach me the opposite of this growing up, so I thought it was interesting. <laughs> After about like the like first to third of November, I've had success with like blind calling, especially rattling, just go right off that the deep end that last week of october it's like i can rattle in anything and everything i've had rattle in some big bucks mm-hmm. killed one on october 25th last year mm-hmm. and then it seems like as soon as they start getting on to does like they don't care hmm. M- maybe you catch one on the right moment i've grunted deer in and the early does there's no doubt yeah. but in terms of blind calling and stuff like i think it goes back to what don's saying is like they're either on a doe already or they just came off and it's not hard to find the nest. yeah in october you're not competing with a lot like it's just they're looking to whoop somebody's ass or to yep. find the first doe and there isn't very many of them yep you know but come november they got a lot of all that hmm. and i actually do very little calling i carry a grunt call with me um i used to have carry antlers with me all the time and I just think that uh, most in most situations, for every mature buck that you're able to call in, you're probably going to spook 10 or 20 others and mm. not even ever know it. That's it's fair. just like you're banging your antlers together and you're telling the mature buck, here I am, don't come over here because I'm going to shoot you. And yeah, it's almost fair. the opposite effect of what you, you really think. Mm. Now, if you catch one in the right mindset, yeah, he's sure. going to come in. I, I've rattled in bucks. 
but uh, I just think that it's more counterproductive than productive most of the time. I can probably guess by your response to that. How do you feel about decoys? <laughs> I've used decoys. I've shot deer over decoys, but I'll tell you what, I've spooked more deer with a decoy than I've ever pulled in. Yeah. Um, I, I just won't use them anymore. It's Yeah, they're risky. I think that's yeah. interesting. I mean, because I, um, trying to think back, I don't know... I bet I could count the number of mature bucks, big bucks that I've rattled in on one hand. That said, in terms of grunt and snort wheeze, that's helped me close the deal on several yeah. big mature bucks. Yeah. You know, it, I think once you're once you're in that visual, you know, range of that mature buck, you know, letting out a, a good deep grunt or snort wheeze at him can be the difference to him committing or not. Um but from a from a rattle standpoint, whether seen or blind, yeah, I mean, I've rattled in a ton of bucks. Don't get me wrong, but I would say most of them are probably three and younger. Would be my guess. Well, I, I agree one hundred percent on the grunt call being more effective than rattling. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've grunted in a lot of bucks, and I still carry a grunt call. And you know, if I see a buck that's out of range, I won't hesitate to pull the grunt call out and yep. give it a shot. And I've had it work and pulled them in and shot them. Yep. So, uh, just I, I would much rather try a grunt call than rattling antlers. So, hmm. kind of grunt tip you got there? So. <laughs> uh, I've got more grunt tubes than you can count. Probably some they don't even make anymore. Uh, my favorite, I've got an old Night and Hail from way back. Oh, yeah. One of the first ones that came out that I really like. And then I've got a couple of custom ones that uh, uh, some fans have, have made and sent me that sound really good too. Very cool. So, uh, yeah, yeah, for whatever reason, and again, obviously, no like no sponsor to us. It's just that uh, Primo's Buck Roar has just been like the one that has closed the deal. Like I literally have the same grunt call that I've shot, I don't know, seven or eight mature bucks with. It just seems like the same thing is wrong with all of the other ones. Like they've got a reed in there, and if you blow too hard, it just flattens out. And uh -huh. for whatever reason, the whatever Primo's has in that, it just doesn't do that. You can just rip on it, and it sounds great as loud as you want to get it. Well, I want to sound like a four- or five-year-old, not a two-year-old. Yeah, why. or like a dying goose is what the rest <laughs> of us sound like. You blow it too hard. I bet the custom ones would be good. On yeah, yeah I'd be interested to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's a – and again, I think probably – arguably more overused than underused in the hunting community grunt calls i mean i'll be sitting on public land and it sounds like somebody's playing a trumpet next to me you know yeah <laughs> yeah <All> right yeah <laughs> just for sure no doubt about that <laughs> yeah i i think that as you and again so don in that situation obviously what what i'm kind of taking from that is you're pretty damn confident about the spot that you're in that he's going to pass within bow range yeah, for sure. Damn. And you got to remember that I'm hunting a lot of farm country, you know, small woodlots, um, drainage ditches or creeks with a few trees along the creek. And um, usually if I see a mature buck, um, he's either way across the field, way out of range, or even rifle range, or he's, or he's right in front of me. Mm -hmm. If he comes through the travel corridor where I'm hunting and I'm, I've got, I'm playing the wind, He's usually right in my lap. I usually don't have to call him in. I think that's a so good. I'm not that's a good point. Like the, uh, I don't know what part of you said. It's what southeast Ohio, eastern where, central. Yeah, eastern Ohio, southwest Pennsylvania. Okay. Yeah, so you know that that area is, you know, big woods, hilly terrain. For where that's where a I'm bit at, different than where I spend most of my time. Yeah, where I'm at. A, it's like a transition area um, between like to our east. We've got you know, big timber and it holds a lot of big bucks. I know guys that, that hunt that, um, we would be just out of it even more on the like ag pasture side of it. So like my farm at one time w was primarily a, a big, you know, cattle ranch. And so mm -hmm. it's maybe 40% timbered and 60% pastured at one time. And so now there's no cows on it now. And I'd say it's 40%, um, ag 40%, uh, TSI to timber, you know, five to 10% food plots and a remaining 10% use, useless acreage, essentially, you know, weren't cool season grasses and stuff. Uh-huh. Yeah. I, I think that that's, um, and it's tough to hunt. 
I think that's probably why I would say, not that I overuse it, but I <laughs> utilize my grunt call a lot is I'm in a bigger block usually. So I may be in the game, but you know, he could come out 150 yards from me or hundred yards from me. And so to get him into bow range, you know, he's going to need a little coaxing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, and that, that's a, you know, there's a good lesson here too for the listener is that, you know, there's a lot of guys throwing out advice that kind of contradicts each other. And I, that doesn't mean that one guy's right and one guy's wrong. I think that, uh, you know, I'm sharing advice that's applicable to my experience in the terrain that I hunt in. That doesn't mean that some guy in a different terrain, different state, yeah. different type of property can apply everything that, that I'm saying. But uh, you just kind of kind of you got to look a little deeper than the advice. And where's that advice coming from? And what's that the person giving advice? What's his experience been where he's hunting at? And yeah. uh see if you can apply it to your situation. Yeah. I think that's, that's probably a big take home point is like, you know, we're talking about situations and everyone's a little bit different in terms of what we get into there, but you know, there's some commonalities in terms of doesn't matter what kind of terrain you're hunting or what state you're hunting. Well, yeah, you, know. you should just be skeptical of, of everything like in, in life, first of all, but yeah. even deer hunting, whether it's observations that you have in the field or what people, you know, talk about on podcasts or tell you directly, like you should, heat it, you know, look mm-hmm. at who's, who's talking about it and then question it and test it out for yourself. And yeah, yeah, you'll learn along the way. That's what we're doing. Yeah. I mean, I think that's it. And, and there is, again, it doesn't mean just because we're saying, and at least the three of us are sitting here saying like, Hey, don't be in the stand every chance you get. Doesn't mean that we're telling you not to go out and hunt. We're just saying, you know, use that time wisely to study, to strategize, to make a plan of attack of kind of what you're doing versus just going out and sitting in the woods, you know, because if it, that's if you want to kill, way more, it's way more fun that way. If you, that's if you want to kill a mature buck. Cause right? then when you were, whether you were right or wrong, if you do eventually kill one, you, at least you can feel like you yeah. did something right. Yeah. You know. Well, you know, a lot of times, uh, I, I don't do this as much as I used to, but when, when I finally figured out that I needed to stay away from a stand until the time was, was absolutely right for that stand. I would spend a lot of time in observation stands, yep. you know, out on a field edge where I could see a lot of terrain, but still have a, a chance to have a buck walk by. Now, very rarely did it ever happen like that, but I did get to do a, you know, see a lot of deer from a distance and observe how they, you know, traveled across the property or whatever, where they was entering a feeding area or what, whatever it may be. Uh, if you're one of those guys that just has to be in the woods every day, that's fine. Just don't burn out your good stands until it's time for them. Yep. Spend your time in observation stands. Yeah, that's that's good as well. Uh, or, Don, go, or go mule deer hunting. Yeah, that's it, right? Hunt a different state. <laughs> um, well, Don, listen, man, we appreciate you coming on the podcast. Um, we appreciate you spending some of your morning and afternoon with us here. And and uh, would love to get you back on maybe after the season here and, and kind of hear how everything went from you and really – you know, be able to put kind of the season together with the the strategies and stuff that we talked about here. But I guess the last couple of things that I wanted to touch on for everybody, obviously you got the chasing giants podcast, um, in terms of like the season and as you're doing things, is there, is there anywhere that those guys are able to go and like see your content or, or hear what you're talking about here throughout the season? Yeah. Um, I try to make social media posts on a daily basis. You can go, uh, my Facebook page is Higgins Outdoors, as is my Instagram. I've got the uh, uh, the YouTube channel, Chasing Giants YouTube channel, as well as the podcast. Uh, something that I've done the last few years on social media that's really exploded is uh, I do a daily rut report during the month of November. And, you know, I basically detail what I saw that day. Because during the rut, I'm hunting every day somewhere. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, you know, I, I detail what I've seen as far as buck movement or whatever, what I've seen from my trail cameras. I try to share a, a photo or a video every day on that rut report. So uh, if you follow either my Instagram or Facebook, you'll see all those those daily rut reports. Cool. A lot of videos on the Chasing Giants YouTube channel. So Awesome, man. Sweet. Appreciate everyone's support. Appreciate you guys having me on. And uh, 
um, you know, respect what you guys are doing. I'll be glad to come back anytime you want to have me. Man, I'd love. Thank you. Anytime we can sit down and just talk to you with somebody who's as passionate as Jared and I, I mean, we, we eat it up, man. And, and, you know, it feels like a deer camp and, you know, it's good just to, sometimes it's good just to bounce ideas and have a discussion. I mean, that's really what this, this whole podcast is about is, you know, there's no real track on it. It's just, we just want to talk to you and, and hear people's opinions and what they've got going on and how it can make Jared and I better hunters. And anybody that's listening, maybe gives them a tip that just says, ah, you know what, that's, that's, what's going to kill this deer. Well, I, and I'm still learning, you know, it doesn't matter how many decades I've been a deer hunter or what I've accomplished as a deer hunter. I'm still a student of the whitetail and always picking things up. And you'd be shocked at how many times a beginning hunter will have a conversation with me and he'll say something that triggers something in my head. And I'm thinking, and I'll see something from a new angle and uh, become a, you know, pick up a tip and become a better hunter <laughs> just from something somebody had in, or mentioned in conversation. Well, if so I'm a, that's why I enjoy these podcasts so much. Yeah. If I'm a giant uh, Midwest whitetail and I just heard you say you're still learning, I'd be scared shitless at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, well, we appreciate it, man. And uh, yeah, if anybody's listening, to go check out Don's stuff on the Chasing Giants podcast and YouTube channel, and look at the Higgins Outdoors social media accounts. And and again, Don, we appreciate you coming on, man, and and really admire what you've been doing. And Jared and I always are you know, staying in tune with what you got, because I do think that it's a wealth of information, um, you know, for anybody that's just passionate about deer management and property management and, and whitetail hunting. Well, like I said, thanks for having me on. You guys get to Illinois, look me up. I'll buy lunch. All right, buddy. I'm a little bit north of where you're hunting at, but uh, I don't know how you take Interstate 70 out. We do. I'm, I'm not far off of 70 here, just as you come into Illinois. So, uh, when you're coming out, look me up and uh, maybe I can meet you and buy lunch. We'll hold, good. we'll hold you to this. <laughs> All right. Maybe on the way back with some racks in the back. There you go. That'd be awesome. Fantastic. All right, buddy. We'll talk to you, Don. Thank you, man. All right. See Take you, care, guys. We'll see you. Okay. Bam. <laughs> the man kills giants. I'd like to see. Can we pull some? Do you have some of this? I want to see the one he killed last year. I know. I know he's killed some giants. So jaunt. He's at a two twenty one gross. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Yeah, I think he. I think I remember reading this. He watched it for three years potentially. Mm -hmm. Man, I'm jealous of some of that luxury to like be able to watch a deer for three. Look at that friggin' <laughs> wow, <laughs> toad. That's brute. Yep, and he killed a one eighty five last year too. That's a jaunt. <laughs> A two twenty one and a one eighty five. That's the one ninety seven and three is net. Yep. Yep. Two twenty one gross. That's crazy, man. That's a big old buck. Big old buck. Yep. It's interesting when you uh, first of all, I mean, how cool is it to be able to have nothing like say, hey, come subscribe to this podcast. But if you haven't subscribed to this podcast, how cool is it to have guys like um Don Higgins and Jeff Sturgis and like we're literally bringing all of this information together and everybody's got different wow. goal models of John. Do you, no, do you see this? This is the deer transition. This yeah. is two, three. That's him at four. Oh, we kill it at four. Oh, that's the sheds. Sheds. Oh my! Mm. That's him uh, when he killed him. Two twenty-one. That's insane. Oh my! He'll do. <sighs> you kill us down on film? I think so. I think it's on the uh, Chasing Giants YouTube channel, or it should be this year. I think he. I think wow. maybe it's a year what out. A giant. Oh, there you go. View complete video of Mel. Here's his YouTube video. Click that link. Yeah, we gotta pull that up. We're recording the screen still, right? Or no? Recording. Oh, it's twenty five minutes. Jump ahead. Like three quarters of the way through it. To get some video footage of that buck uh, that summer in velvet, he Here was hanging out in a bachelor group with another big uh, six and a half year old buck that I ended up killing that fall. There you go. But uh, whatever, somewhere. In every there. noise a buck could possibly make that morning. Um, My but, gosh. but no male. But I, I, a couple of times I caught glimpses of male in the brush, <sighs> but he just wouldn't come in. These deer were around me were basically under three or four Dude, giant that is a trees monster where the brush body wasn't on real that thick deer. under those big trees. And Mel kind of skirted that. He kind of stayed out where the brush was thicker right on the edge. And uh, 
I, I had one buck at one point come That's right stunned. under my stand, and I'm filming him right, right below me, and he hears something coming, and he oh. tenses up and turns, and I heard it too at the same time, and I look up, here comes Mel right at us. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> What an amazing animal. <laughs> wow. Oh. That'll do it. He's self filming. Yep. Wow. Don Higgins, the man. Yeah. That's unbelievable. <laughs> Seven yards he shot him. <laughs> wow. That's crazy, man. That's it. Cool. Um, so that's on the Chasing Giants YouTube channel if anybody wants to check out the full hunt of Mel. Um, but even just from what we saw, it's, see, I think what's cool with Don, too, is he builds, it, it, per what he even said there, he builds relationships with these deer. You know, and, and he's watching them and watching them, watching them patterns and identifying and like getting to know these deer, which probably goes in tune with what he was just saying there in that, in that film and that, you know, it gets, and we've kind of had this a little bit, it gets bittersweet. Unfortunately, it's usually not because you or I tag them. It's just because he dies or disappears, but we invest a lot into these deer and understanding them and learning them. Um, you know, this will be the first year in four that I won't be hunting that buck on the mountain. At least I don't think so. Cause he seems like he's dead. He's not around, you know, and, and it's bittersweet because man, I like, I finally thought I was getting close to him last year. And so it was like, okay, next year, like I know what he's going to do. He's gone. Eventually that time runs out, you know, and it's, I think that's where, um, and again, this isn't anything negative against people who just love to hunt and kill bucks or just like to kill mature bucks. But, there are a certain group of hunters and I don't want people to look at us as trophy hunters or look at us as different, but we, we very much study and try to understand a single particular buck in an area. And then we declare war on them and it's just us against him. And it doesn't mean that we wouldn't kill another buck, but like we are really, really trying to hunt this buck and outsmart this buck. And to me, that's where I'm at in my hunting career is, man, there's nothing better than trying to outsmart him. And by the time I make the move to go hunt him, like, man, I've done everything to put myself in a position to win that, that game. Yeah. And it's, it's a different way of hunting. It's a cool endeavor. And it's just, you know, it's a unique set of circumstances. I think that people get to go out and do that, you know, cause to try to trying to accomplish that like in a group hunting setting or on a you know piece very, of public land very hard where you almost impossible yeah you already control so few of the factors on a property where it's just you and the deer you know so so many things can happen mm -hmm. and when you introduce other you know things like hunting pressure and uh it's super hard whatever yeah. it is it's yeah and it, maybe it isn't possible for everyone i i would encourage um anybody that has i guess private land or or big chunks of public like Attempt to dedicate yourself um, to try to kill a buck, study a buck. And I think that ultimately your success rates are higher. Whether you end up killing that buck or another buck, the way that you study that deer and approach that deer will make you a better hunter overall and probably more successful. Um, but it isn't necessarily a long-term stability for everybody because hunting pressure, other people hunting, public land, whatever it is. But it definitely is... Um, is a somewhat of a, a a passion project that you can really appreciate when you try to outsmart a single deer. Uh, and sometimes I think it um, cleans up the mess of hunting where you're like, oh, this buck's here, this buck's here, he's going here, like I could hunt here, or maybe if I'm here, I'll see both of them. Like just streamline on like, I'm just gonna kill this deer. Um, but you know, it is what it is. and. Uh, I think Don was pretty awesome. Uh, it was great to have him on the podcast. I look forward to getting him back at the end of the season and kind of reflecting on what he what he encountered. And uh, it's October, so let's go hunting. Be hunting this weekend. Go time. Go time. 
Well, we appreciate everybody listening to uh, episode 40 with Don Higgins um, from Chasing Giants and Real World. Um, if uh, you like this podcast, give us a subscribe. We appreciate it. Um, we got plenty more coming. I think the next one that you'll be hearing is Adam Hayes. That's right. Um, so another guy who's killing multiple two hundos. Moon God, baby. Yeah, and anybody who's been pen up waiting for us to really get into this moon stuff, what better way than to do it with the moon guide himself? The moon guide himself. <laughs> We're going to get into it. <laughs> they call me the moon guide. Well, we appreciate it. Uh, thanks for listening to Hunter Podcast, and we will see you next week. It's seeing me. Oh.